This video is brought to you by War Thunder. What did you see, Doc? You don't want to know. Good evening. There's not very many games that have had as huge of an effect on internet culture as Team Fortress 2. Growing up on the internet in the 2010s, it was damn near impossible to not at some point stumble across some kind of TF2 meme video or animation. Whether it was the official animated shorts that went viral year after year and defined the game's characters in the hearts of millions, or its fan animations made in Gary's Mod and Source Filmmaker that usually fell somewhere on a spectrum between beautiful work of art and laughably nonsensical stories starring some of the stupidest characters that the internet has ever seen, so long as you were active online, it was almost guaranteed that at some point you were going to see something TF2 related. The game was a walking meme and inside joke machine, kept alive by countless creators and animators making a wide range of new stories come to life in the TF2 world year after year after year. One of my personal favorite phenomena were the TF2 freaks. Some animators simply weren't happy with how normal the TF2 cast were, and decided to distort them into demented fan-made creatures with weird appearances, weird voices, and even weirder behavior. They would twist and contort in strange ways and say nonsensical phrases before sputtering away and leave you wondering what in the hell you were even watching. I am pain is cupcake. I will eat you. However, as the culture slowly grew surrounding these TF2 freaks, we started seeing something really weird form. A lot of these videos were clearly intended to be funny, but it's impossible to ignore how many of them also had an unsettling edge. Now that's not to say they were scary. Most of the freaks you'd see were far too ridiculous looking to ever be that. But the sight of these familiar locations subverted with weird creatures slithering around, doing abrupt violent attacks, and repeating stilted edited voice lines sometimes left the viewer feeling feeling a little awkward. No doubt part of what made these videos work was just how wrong they felt. TF2 had some spooky stuff in it, sure, but it was a comical game at heart, and the game's official Halloween events largely consisted of tame and goofy monster mash content like purple ghosts and hats and paper bag masks. The TF2 freaks, meanwhile, introduced us to Lovecraftian monsters like the Vagineer, who would suck innocent people into his giant, suspiciously shaped mouth, or Christian Brutal Sniper, a psychopathic killer who would brutally chop anyone who got in his way into bits with a quiet smile. The tone of these characters was completely completely different to those seen in the actual game. Yet all of this off-kilter activity was usually juxtaposed with the same pastel colors and jolly quaint backing tracks seen in other, more innocent TF2 Gmod videos of the time. And while the eeriness of it was usually short-lived, if you came across one of them before bed on a school night, some of these videos could leave you feeling a little weirded out and make you scramble for a more normal video to cleanse your palate. However, Amidst all the strange TF2 movies that I gladly let rot my brain as a child, there was only one I came across that I remember leaving an actual, lasting, chilling impression on me. It was a series from 2012 simply called Team Killer. Team Killer introduced an antagonist of the same name, a serial killer psychopath akin to the likes of Michael Myers or Freddy Krueger, who would violently terrorize and torture the helpless cast members of TF2, not dissimilar to how a sniper with 10,000 hours does in the actual game. What made Team Killer unique from the other TF2 freaks, however, was that he went beyond simply unnerving the viewer. Team Killer delved into a kind of visceral, blood-soaked horror reminiscent of films like Saw, pushing TF2's world and its characters to their most gruesome limits in tellings of these dark, bloody, horrific nighttime massacres, violently impaling and slashing our familiar beloved characters to pieces, sending helpless unarmed bystanders running and screaming for help just to get slaughtered anyway. As a kid, these short movies terrified me but I also couldn't look away from them. Like a car, car crash in, in slow, slow motion. motion. Looking back today, most of these Team Killer videos were basically choppy Gmod slideshows and relied mainly on sound effects and music. And the Team Killer's backstory and motivations didn't make a whole lot of sense either. But for what they were, these videos made for pretty compelling spooky media for a young child. And more importantly, Team Killer showed that, despite Team Fortress 2's comical nature, there was great promise in the idea of, and a genuine audience for, a horror movie set in the TF2 universe. For anyone who hasn't been living under a rock for the last year or so, you can probably tell where this is going. It's been a little over a year since a YouTube video called Emesis Blue took the TF2 community and the greater internet by storm. It entranced the masses in a bloody horror show not too different from those seen in those old Team Killer videos I used to watch, but did so in the format of an actual feature-length film with a professional level of polish, reveling in a dark and twisted story for a near two-hour runtime. Emesis Blue is not only one of the most technically impressive things to ever come out of the TF2 community, but it's a film that stands on its own as a viral phenomenon that made a huge sect of the internet view this beloved game from a completely new perspective while also sickening them to their core with its crazy body horror and stomach-sinking brutality. It's pretty much the magnum opus of TF2 horror, and it's also a loving homage to the horror genre in general, featuring countless references to scary films, TV shows, and games you might recognize as you watch. On release, Emesis Blue's reception was incredible, but thanks to its abstract and non-linear storytelling, pretty much no one seemed to fully understand it on a first watch. And the top comments on the video showed just how much it bewildered TF2 fans on release. The film has already been covered by a few other creators, and some would say I'm a little late to the 
the party to be making a video on it. But to many in the community, the film story still remains incredibly hazy even to this day. And there's also a whole lot that's been left unsaid and unsolved even after a year's worth of analyses. On top of that, there's a lot that's happened in the world of its creators, Fortress Films, in the year since its release that, in my opinion, make the film and its story worth analyzing in greater detail. They've released a lot of statements and exclusive content that massively recontextualizes some parts of the movie. And with the recent anniversary and announcement of an apparent sequel on the way, I figured what better time than now to revisit this masterpiece and see if we can finally take a good crack at understanding Emesis Blue. In this video, I'm going to try to bring as much clarity to this film as possible. I'm going to attempt to genuinely understand its themes and character arcs, what its story implies about the TF2 universe, what the film's actual plot is beneath all its surreal imagery, and most importantly, what the fucking Emesis Blue is. You've just crossed into a realm where life and death are mere playthings. A dimension where the respawn of man is both a blessing and a curse. Out in the bone-dry badlands, a malfunctioning contraption known as the respawn machine has turned the gift of life into a grotesque nightmare. Welcome to the Conagher Slaughterhouse, nestled deep within the forsaken lands of Mortem, New Mexico. It's here where a spectral figure emerges from the depths of a junkie doctor's fractured mind. Next stop, the respawn point of your nightmares. Before we continue though, I gotta tell you about the amazing sponsor of this video, War Thunder. War Thunder is the most comprehensive vehicle combat game in the world, available on both PC and consoles. Take command of over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships from 10 major nations, ranging from the biplanes and armored cars of the 1920s to the fighter jets and battle tanks of today. War Thunder has one of the most sophisticated vehicle damage models in gaming. Every vehicle you see is intricately modeled. Things like engines, fuel tanks, weapons, and crew are all susceptible to to dynamic damage or disabling from enemy fire. And different types of armor, shells, and missiles behave just like their real-world counterparts. One of the best things about War Thunder is just how much customization it offers to the player. In between wreaking havoc with your very own awesome tanks and planes, you can also fine-tune them to your exact liking with countless camouflages, historical markings, and decorations. There's even community-made ones. Whether you're in the market for a competitive wartime simulator or just a more casual, arcade experience, War Thunder has a little something for everybody. Join up and become part of a massive community of over 70 million Million players, all taking part in the breathtaking experience that is War Thunder. There's an unmatched amount of high quality content in this game, and there really is no game better suited for fans of military history. You can play War Thunder for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox today using my link in the pinned comment or video description. New and returning players who haven't played in six months will also receive a massive bonus pack across all platforms that includes multiple premium vehicles, the exclusive vehicle decorator Eagle of Valor, 100,000 Silver Lions, and seven days of premium account. It's available for a limited time only, so make sure to be quick. Thanks again to War Thunder for sponsoring this video, but now let's get back to business. Emesis Blue was made by Fortress Films, an Australian indie film team led by two guys named Chad Payne and Anton Palazzari, and is by far their most crowning achievement. However, it's not where they got their start. The Fortress Films YouTube channel was technically started in 2014, responsible for pumping out a few simplistic and short SFMs before going into hibernation to work on much bigger things. Their earliest publicly available upload came on August 7th, 2018, in the form of a 28 minute long SFM animation called Spies Disguise. This might seem like a silly and lighthearted video at first, and it is for the most part, but Spies this guy's actually sowed the early seeds for Emesis Blue, and is in fact set in the same cinematic universe. You don't need to see either movie to enjoy the other, but the context does make some scenes in Emesis Blue make more sense, so it's worth touching on that film a little bit before we get to the main course. The story of Spy's disguise follows a disgruntled blue spy named SO9, who is massively unsuccessful in helping his team gain any ground in a match of Dust Bowl, but finally gets a lucky break when he accidentally upgrades his disguise kit, allowing him to disguise as and inherit the abilities of engineers' buildings. He uses this newfound unfair advantage to easily die dominate his enemies, killing them in new, unheard of, unexpected, and often comical ways. In a fit of frustration, the enemy red engineer, named Dell, heads underground and destroys a piece of technology called the Respawn Machine. As I'm sure many of you know, this Respawn Machine technology later becomes a focal point in Emesis Blue. In Spy's disguise, however, its destruction just sets the plot up so whoever loses the showdown between Dell and SO9 can't come back from the dead anymore. Their deaths are now permanent. Dell heads to Badwater after receiving a taunting note, and most of his team gets wiped out by SO9 and his sidekick Blue Engineer. However, However, Dell turns out to have an ace in the hole in the form of a goddamn mech suit. One of the things that's a little off-putting about Spy's disguise is that it has much harsher gore than you'd probably expect from a goofy SFM TF2 animation. Guts spill out of mercenaries in jarringly visceral ways. And also, Uncle Dane gets fucking owned. 
Anyway, SO9 ultimately wins, killing Dell forever. However, in the last five minutes of its runtime, Spy's Disguise basically becomes a completely different movie. It takes a massive turn for the surreal, showing some kind of elaborate dream sequence of SO9 confronting his mechanical self, almost as if he's lost his sense of identity and become more machine than man. He wakes up hospitalized in the care of a blue medic donning a cross necklace, and sees hallucinations of his dead arch nemesis Dell everywhere he looks. It seems the sentry gun augmentations have cost him his sanity. The film finally closes with SO9 getting visited by his old engineer friend, before getting strapped into an ambulance by the medic and hauled away, visions of Dell still haunting him. It's a really jarring ending for what had up until that point been a pretty run-of-the-mill TF2 animation. After the release of Spy's Disguise, Fortress Films immediately went full steam ahead on production of Emesis Blue. And after five years and a few analog horror-inspired teasers, it finally arrived on February 20th, 2023. The full, nearly two-hour-long movie was posted for free to the Fortress Films YouTube channel, with a vague description reading, On Halloween night of 1968, an executive of the Builders League United Corporation mysteriously vanishes in Mortem, New Mexico. A private detective and washed up war veteran team up to find him, yet the man they hunt is more dangerous than they can possibly imagine. So with all that context out of the way, why don't we finally take a look at Emesis Blue itself. <laughs> To start us off, it'll save us a lot of headache if I give you a rundown of the film's star players now, instead of introducing them as they come. There's a number of characters that appear in Emesis Blue, but there's only a few that the plot seems to really revolve around. And for ease of explanation, I've split them into duos. First is Medic and Scout. In this film, the Christian Medic from Spy's Disguise returns as our main protagonist. He takes on his regular TF2 canon name, Dr. Ludwig, but also takes on a newly established first name, Fritz, a reference to Fritz Lang, a German director responsible for a German film from 1931 called M, which was a major source of inspiration for, and also makes a direct appearance in Emesis Blue. Fritz is incredibly neurotic. His medical profession and the PTSD-inducing horrors he's witnessed are played very seriously, and his portrayal actually reminded me of Valve's official Meet the Medic outtakes that showed an extremely anxious medic dealing with the harsh realities of battlefield medicine. I'd almost given up. <clears throat> it had been my darkest moment. The Scout, meanwhile, is a young man named Jeremy. His last initial specified as E. This is a reference to German 985, whose name on Google is listed as Jeremy Elbertson, and who some say was the inspiration for Scout being named Jeremy in actual TF2 canon. Jeremy's innocence and youth is basically the focal point of his character, with others in the film often referring to him as a boy and his relationship with his mother being stressed quite a lot. He even wears a hat that looks like something straight out of a child's wardrobe. Anyway, Fritz and Jeremy are two friends who have clearly known each other for a long time, as the medic's office is decorated with framed pictures of the two. However, there's a clear driving wedge between them. Jeremy is timid and paranoid, constantly seeking answers and seeming lost. Fritz, meanwhile, seems to know too much, and appears to be actively holding back some kind of information from Jeremy that casts an ominous cloud over many of their interactions. You'll see what I mean as soon as the film starts. The second duo, or I guess trio, is Jules Archibald and the Man Brothers. The Man Brothers, Redman Man and Blue Tark Man, are background characters in actual TF2 canon. They're biological brothers and respective owners of the Red and Blue companies fighting over land in New Mexico, locked in a bitter blood feud over ownership of property their late father bestowed them in as well. They make an appearance in the flesh toward the end of the film's runtime and have a pretty decent bearing on its grander plot. They also both use these strange high-poly models that appear to be based on the G-Man from Half-Life Alex, giving them a very uncanny, wrinkly appearance. Then there's a brand new original character, Jules Archibald. Jules takes on the likeness and mannerisms of the civilian character seen in the mod Team Fortress 2 classic, though in this film he's instead portrayed as a part of Blue's leadership and a pivotal player in the war between Red and Blue. Jules is also said to be the governor of New Mexico and is coming up for a election soon at the time of the film, hence the billboards we see of him at various scenes. He's the missing blue team executive that the film's description speaks of, and a good amount of the movie revolves around him and his disappearance. And finally, there's Soldier and Spy. These are two collaborative agents and hired guns for blue team, and by extension Archibald, and they're the ones in charge of tracking him down now that he's vanished. In this movie, Soldier is shown to be more righteous and intelligent than most people would expect of his character, and actually might be the most reliable narrator in the entire movie, though he still has some dirtbass moments. <laughs> And last but not least, there's the spy, given the name Jacques Morneau, who is shown to be particularly pretentious and bitter. His extreme arrogance lives up to French stereotypes, and in fact, most of the mistakes the duo make are pretty much entirely his fault. I found him to be a bit unlikable, to be honest. Have you picked your favorites and least favorites yet? Figured out who you're rooting for? Nah, who am I kidding? Pretty much every single one of these characters are in for a hellish nightmare from the word go, so don't get too attached. With that out of the way, though, let's get to the prologue, and more importantly, the respawn machine. 
The opening shot of Emesis Blue reintroduces the respawn machine technology we saw in Spies Disguise, though this time it's shown in a much more sinister light. We're informed that it's manufactured by a company called Helix Technologies, then shown the increasingly terrifying aftermath of four different men who were put through the machine. The first one comes out relatively normal from the looks of his silhouette, but he yells, it's eternity in there, before collapsing to his knees. The second subject comes out and says, my eyes hurt. Then we get a quick shot showing that he seems to be bleeding from his eyes, mouth, and nose. The third subject comes out completely silent silent, just writhing and twitching ominously. And then finally, the fourth subject splatters the window frame and door of the machine with blood, before what seems to be a sensor bar blocks the left window. Lord knows what happened to that guy. The respawn machine in this movie attempts to fill in somewhat of a plot hole in the TF2 universe. The fact that there are seemingly infinite clones of the same nine mercenaries, somehow simultaneously fighting for both teams. This could be explained much more simply in the game's earlier days, where it could be said that the mercenaries weren't literal people, but instead metaphoric archetypes for the soldiers in the Red vs. Blue War. However, it seems that the Gmod community community's portrayal of the mercenaries as real people rubbed off on Valve early on, as the comics came to establish them as individual humans with social security numbers, and Miss Pauling even tells stories over the contractor about going grocery shopping with Spy TF2. According to Anton Pelazari, the film's producer, Emesis Blue is meant to portray a more grounded take on the Red vs. Blue conflict from TF2, with the main difference being that, while TF2 casually ignores questions about these things, Emesis Blue takes the premise of these mercenary clone armies deathly seriously. It's a world where not all mercenaries are necessarily boots-on-the-ground infantry, either. There's non-combatant pencil-pushing mercs as well. For example, the medic character Fritz is said to be a particularly important clone who's in charge of the blue team's entire hospital. So we can assume he hasn't seen the battlefield much and is in more of an administrative position. And of course, the film goes as far as to introduce the idea of a respawn technology to explain why these mercenaries just keep coming back to life. It's important to note that, according to Anton, this respawning process isn't the same as being cloned. In the case of cloning, you'd be making more than one instance of the same person. With respawning, the mercenaries are literally just being brought back to life and re forged through the machine, which is apparently a lot more cost-effective than biologically reproducing them. That being said, cloning technology does exist in the Emesis Blue universe, and many of the characters we see in the film are still clones. It's a bit confusing, but it all comes together to ask some really freaky questions about these mercenary psychologies and senses of identity, and it's a really interesting take on the world in my opinion. Anton has also confirmed that this two-fort respawn machine we see here is nowhere near the only respawn machine in the Emesis Blue universe, which makes sense given the appearance that one made back in Spy's Disguise. However, it is apparently the only respawn machine that malfunctions in the way this prologue shows us. The others, we can assume, work just fine. It's just that, much like an actual TF2, those in the Emesis Blue universe lining up for two fort are in for a uniquely torturous experience. Sorry for the long-windedness there, but while the respawn machine is one of the most pivotal elements of the entire film, it's also a bit complex and confusing, especially if you've only seen the movie once or twice and haven't read any of the writer's Q&As. So I thought it was worth taking this opportunity to try and thoroughly explain the spin it puts on TF2's world. It should make the events of the movie a little easier to understand going forward. Anywho, all this prologue is really trying to teach you is that this fucked up two-fort respawn machine is basically a horrific defiance of nature. A spit in the face of God that the rest of the film is going to heavily revolve around. And given how terrible the world of medicine was back in the 1960s, I think it actually ties into TF2's setting surprisingly well. The second half of the prologue follows the medic character Fritz through a freaky nightmare sequence. He's haunted in his office by a plague doctor figure, and shown visions of bodies from the respawn machine being disposed of in two-fort, as well as massive amounts of blood flowing out of the respawn machine, which is a reference to a scene from The Shining. This plague doctor haunting Fritz with visions of the two-fort respawn machine's horrors is referred to as The Undertaker, and will go on to be one of the most prominent and contentious figures in the movie. From what I've read online, some interpret him as an alter ego or dark side to Fritz, others interpret him as a metaphor for death itself, and some interpret him as the ghost of one of the men we saw in the prologue. I have my own explanation that I'll get into later as the movie goes on. Whoever the Undertaker is, he reaches out to grab Fritz, and in that moment, he jolts awake in his office in the real world. It turns out there is no spooky plague doctor in Fritz's office, only his good friend Jeremy. Based on the clock on the wall, Jeremy's arrived here around 9 p.m. He apologizes to Fritz for coming into his office so late in the day, and asks him if he ever has bad dreams. Fritz sighs and grabs his glasses, and under a bottle of spilled pills, we see a newspaper telling us that Governor Jules Archibald has gone missing, presumed to have been kidnapped, with Redmond and Blue Tark both blaming the abduction on one another. We cut away to Fritz giving Jeremy a medical checkup as he describes his aforementioned bad dreams, teeth falling out of his mouth, spilling blood all over the sink. Fritz asks Jeremy if he's worried about something, which he affirms. Yeah, actually. You ever get the feeling like you're being watched? What do you mean? When I went to bed last night, I could swear there was someone standing outside my window. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Someone was just passing by. Doc, I was on the second floor. Uh, have you spoken to your mother about this? She says it's all in my head. 
just like Fritz, Jeremy seems to be being haunted by visions of some kind of ominous figure. And finishing the checkup, Fritz tries to give Jeremy a bottle of the same Valium pills he's been taking that we saw spilled all over his desk just a moment ago. Jeremy refuses the pills, insisting, I don't need this stuff, and remarking that Fritz sounds like his mother. Whoever was outside Jeremy's house, Jeremy seems very confident that they were real. But now, both his mom and Fritz have blown him off and told him that he's just seeing things. Fritz then asks Jeremy about how his mother feels about him apparently moving back in with her. After being laid off? Are you kidding me? I'm gonna sue the hell out of Blue for what they did to me. Well, you wouldn't be the first. Doc, if they ever hit you with something, you hit back twice as hard, you hear me? As Fritz starts trying to usher Jeremy out of the office and give him a ride home, a box of VHS tapes in the distance mysteriously tips over, spilling all over the floor. These VHS tapes are all movies that the creators of the film were inspired by, by the way, which is a neat Easter egg. Jeremy takes the opportunity to pocket a VHS tape of M, the same 1931 movie whose director I mentioned earlier as having inspired the medic character's name. However, as the two make their way out of Fritz's office, a pair of double doors randomly swing open behind them. Both of these characters seem to be having paranoid hallucinations of strange things. But whatever it is that's pushing stuff around in Fritz's office seems to be very real. Maybe their visions aren't so fake after all. Before we get any more context as to what Blue did to Jeremy, Fritz rushes him out, and we get the first real chapter of the film, Graveyard Shift. Chapter 1 starts off in the rainy streets, introducing us to Jacques and the soldier as they follow a lead on the previously established kidnapping of Jules Archibald. Soldier stays behind in the car and spots an ominous man in the distance staring at him. If you look closely at his silhouette, it almost looks like another soldier. He begins raising his pistol, but Jacques opens the door to scold him, telling him to just keep a lookout for the police while he heads out to confront their lead. In a nearby alley, Jacques confronts a heavy dressed in a black suit and holds him at gunpoint. Other than The Undertaker, this is the first character in the film shown to wear black, but it won't be the last. These black clothes represent a faction independent of red or blue. And it looks like prior to Jacques showing up, this heavy in black was planning to meet with someone to hand off the briefcase he's holding. This briefcase goes on to be a very important part of the plot. Based on the line, You know the price of betrayal, friend. It also seems that this heavy is a former member of blue, and Jacques believes him to be in some way linked to Archibald's kidnapping. Jacques fails miserably at taking the briefcase from the heavy, instead getting pummeled around while the soldier sits in the car listening to a police radio interceptor. It's here we get a funny, but also very peculiar piece of dialogue. This is 189 reporting a fight with Three to local cemetery. The vehicle in question is a black hearse. Ten nine, say again, but a, a black hearse. Ten four, that is correct. One eight nine, is this a joke? We still have a freaking hearse at this hour. <laughs> well, oh, you think that's funny, one eight nine? That wasn't me. Oh crap! Who the hell is that? Putting aside the gag of soldier not realizing they could hear him laughing, the police are detailing a 503, police code for an automobile theft, on a local cemetery's black hearse. This will be very important in the coming moments. We briefly cut back to Jacques struggling with the heavy, then immediately back to soldier waiting outside the car, as the same black hearse that the police radio just mentioned pulls up out of nowhere not far in front of him. Soldier then seemingly notices the tussle between the heavy and Jacques and comes to the rescue. Hey, Stalingrad! Eat this! You're welcome. Funnily enough, in the credits, the writers actually do run with Stalingrad as the official name for this black heavy character. So we will too. Soldier shoots and kills Stalingrad, much to the chagrin of Jacques, who scolds him since Stalingrad was apparently their only lead on finding Archibald and is now dead. For some reason, Jacques orders Soldier to go fetch a camera from the car. And while he's gone, bends down to collect Stalingrad's elusive suitcase. However, he looks up to notice the same black hearse from earlier and promptly gets pistol whipped by none other than the Undertaker. The same man from Medic's opening hallucination. Here's our second confirmation that these mercenaries' hallucinations might be more real than they realize. The Undertaker appears physically in the real world, steals a fucking car, very nearly shoots Jacques in the head, steals the briefcase before we even get to see what's inside it, and then dashes off and speeds away in his stolen hearse. Returning with Jacques' camera just a little late, Soldier even manages to snap a quick analog photo of the assailant driving away. Stalingrad refused to specify who the handoff for the briefcase was, but since The Undertaker showed up mere moments after Soldier and Jacques' early ambush, and since him and Stalingrad both wear black as if in cahoots, it seems likely the briefcase was meant for the Plague Doctor's hands all along. Stalingrad might be dead, and the briefcase might have slipped Jacques and Soldier's hands, but at least they've got a new lead to follow. That brings us to the next chapter. Chapter 2 
Chapter two opens with Fritz driving Jeremy home from his office. We learn that Jeremy was let go from the company due to some kind of accident involving the respawn machine we saw in the beginning. It seems the complications from said accident are why he feels so wronged by Blue. But Fritz breaks the news to Jeremy that he isn't the first to try and sue Blue over something like this, which puzzles him. Fritz eventually breaks and reveals to Jeremy that he knows more than he's been letting on, detailing a time he witnessed the respawn machine malfunction on the front lines. What is wrong with the respawn machine? Uh, it doesn't always work like it's supposed to. Some get stuck inside, trying to come through. What the hell are you talking about, Doc? Uh, I've only seen it happen once. On the front lines, he came through screaming horribly. When I ran out to see what happened, I... I... What did you see, Doc? You don't want to know. After the rest of what I'd assume was then a silent ride home, Fritz drops Jeremy off at his house, but declines to go in and say hi to his mom. Jeremy buzzes in and his mom scolds him for getting home so late and for being soaking wet from the rain. The next scene, however, is a turning point in the story and one of the best scenes in the film in my opinion. I don't want to spoil it for anyone, so I'll just let it play for a minute. So how was the doctor here? Fine. Did you ask him to stop by? Tried. I feel bad for the guy. What's the matter with him? I think he's on something. Du hast dabei einen schönen Ball. Dinner is ready here. Okay, hang on. Hello? Thanks for the ride, Doc. You sure you don't want to come in? At least say hi to Mom? What did you... Who is this? You really gotta get out more often, Doc. What... What the hell is this? Who are you? Hey, Ma! I'm home! This scene in Jeremy's mom's house is one of the most poignant moments in the entire film for a lot of reasons. Some obvious, some not. In case you didn't follow, Scout comes home to his mom who's got a lasagna cooking in the oven. He puts a horror movie on, the same M VHS tape that he stole from Fritz's office. Now's a good time to mention what this M movie is actually about. From what I've gleaned, M is a German thriller film about a serial child murderer named Hans Beckert, and how his killing spree sends his fellow townspeople and even other criminals into a paranoid hysteria. Notably, the murderer in the film is eventually caught due to another character bumping into him and leaving an M marking on his coat. And his appearances in the film are marked by him whistling in the Hall of the Mountain King. M is apparently considered one of the best German films of all time, and is actually available on YouTube for completely free. Though as you could probably expect, pretty much all of the comments nowadays are about Emesis Blue. Anyways, in this scene Jeremy watches the opening shot of the film, wherein a little girl playing with a baseball gets abducted by the killer. Jeremy plays with a baseball of his own on the couch, making small talk with his mom about Fritz's odd behavior. The camera then pans over to a bottle of Valium pills, just like those Fritz is seen taking, hinting to us that they're the cause of it all. The phone suddenly rings just as Jeremy's mother calls him for dinner, but if you pay attention, you'll notice that the way she says the phrase dinner's ready, dear, sounds completely unnatural. Dinner's ready, dear! And even stranger, when Jeremy picks up the phone, he's once again faced with more of those paranormal shenanigans he was telling Fritz about. This time, whoever's on the other line plays back what seems to be a recording of the conversation he was just having outside. Thanks for the ride, Doc. You sure you don't want to come in? At least say hi to Ma? Tell her I did, Scout. I have to get Who back to this? the office. You really gotta get out more often, Doc. What, what the hell is this? Who are you? Hey, Ma! I'm home! Confused, agitated, and scared, Jeremy turns once the caller hangs up, and we get this frame. A chess metaphor, representing Jeremy in this very moment. Surrounded by scary, powerful pieces he could never possibly stand a chance against. Then, the events of the scene playing on TV are immediately paralleled. As the young, helpless Jeremy spots his mother's severed head hanging around the corner, before it drops to the floor, giving us our first death of the movie. A scary-looking pyro in a white mask then makes his presence known, and the scene abruptly ends. This is a brilliant moment, one of my favorites in the whole movie, but it's also 
one that leaves us with a hell of a lot of questions. What happens to Jeremy now? Is he next on the decapitation list? Who is responsible for recording Jeremy's conversation with Fritz and playing it back to him over the phone? Or for cutting his beautiful mother's head off and dangling it around the corner like a sicko? Why does the food shown in the oven randomly change between scenes? This one I actually still straight up have no answer for. Leave a comment below if you have any ideas. And finally, just who is this imposing pyro character referred to by the writers as the Butcher? Just like the Undertaker and Stalingrad from earlier, he appears to be aligned with the Black Team. But what do they want with Jeremy? And why did they kill his mom? There's not a lot to go off right now, but one thing's for sure. Jeremy is in trouble. And maybe his mother and Fritz should have listened to him when he said he was being stalked. Also, this isn't related to the plot, but by this point you're probably noticing that Emesis Blue doesn't actually look all that much like TF2 outside of its characters. The world is much more dirty, grimy, dramatic, and often realistic looking than we're used to seeing in SFM shorts set in the TF2 world. This is because a lot of the movie's assets, including even the respawn machine subjects in the prologue, are ripped from less cartoony Source Engine games like Half-Life 2 and Day of Defeat Source. When I first watched this, I thought the team was just making do with a low budget and limited resources, but it turns out this was actually an intentional stylistic choice intended to give the film a more unique and chaotic identity while paying homage to the makeshift vibes of early Gmod and SFM machinimas from the early 2010s, which I think is really cool. Anyways, it's not clear at first, but between now and the next time we see him, Jeremy is kidnapped off screen by the butcher and whoever was dangling that hat around the corner. In the next scene, we follow Fritz as he awakens at the wheel of his ambulance, still parked outside in front of Jeremy's mom's house, which is weird. You'd think he would have heard the commotion, or that the duo responsible for the kidnapping and murder we just witnessed would have been a little less sloppy on this potential witness sitting right outside. In fact, didn't we see his ambulance pulling off as Jeremy walked up to the door? Huh. Maybe he's coming back later? Either way, rightfully concerned for Jeremy, Fritz gets out and goes up to try and buzz into the house, but gets no answer. So he instead forces his way into the house, finding the living room completely dark and empty, save for the M film lifted from his office still playing on the TV. Fritz follows his way toward the light in the kitchen and finds the decapitated head and corpse of Jeremy's poor mom. As he turns the corner, he collapses and gets bathed in an ominous red light as he lays eyes on an M engraved on the wall, just like the one used in the M movie to mark the murderer. The film playing in the living room suddenly gets loud as hell as someone starts banging on the front door. Fritz's eyes suddenly start switching from red to blue repeatedly before he faints and bangs his head on the kitchen counter. <laughs> Fritz's eyes flickering between red and blue is most commonly interpreted as an inner struggle between a good side of Fritz's consciousness and a more unstable, almost demonic side induced by the pills he's taking. So wait, if Fritz was somehow there at the crime scene, and when he comes back to consciousness he's shocked by the aftermath of the killing, and faints while an inner struggle occurs, does this tell us that Fritz is the one who actually killed Jeremy's mother? It seems out of character, and doesn't account for the butcher's appearance, but we've seen in the intro how much he can lose touch with reality. Is he really capable of such a terrible act, especially against his own friend's mother? The scene from M playing on screen when Fritz walks in is from the last 10 minutes of the film, when the murderer confesses to his crimes, but stresses to his jury that he doesn't consciously choose to kill. It's an evil side of him that he can't actually control. Given the relevance the last scene had to the one playing on the TV in it, this parallel is very interesting to read into. Is Fritz trying to convince himself and the audience that he's not the one responsible for this murder, even though he actually is? Before we're given much time to think about it, we're back to the B-plot, Jacques and Soldier. Jacques and Soldier drive around, contemplating the possible contents of the briefcase that the Undertaker stole back from them, looking over the photo Soldier snapped earlier. Then, we get a pretty funny scene where Soldier cleverly uses what he learned in his blunder last chapter to find a new way to tail the Undertaker. What the hell do you think you're doing? I think I know who to ask. Soldier that only receives and doesn't transmit. Brigger, Brigger, this is 185. I'm gonna need an update on that stolen hearse. Roger, 185. This is 187. I have visual on a black hearse heading south of Brixton. 10 4. Tail it! He's pulling up on Purgatory Avenue. I'm gonna intercept. So it's just... Sir, I'm gonna need you to roll down your window. I can't see your face. Whoever that cop is, he just got fucked up bad. The scene ends as the two head out toward the street where the officer was attacked. Purgatory Avenue. Man, is every town and street in New Mexico this ominous sounding in real life? We then cut back to Fritz as he rides around unconsciously. However, he soon comes to and lets out a scream, as it's revealed that he's laying inside a coffin at some kind of church, with none other than the Undertaker sitting at the front of the pews. Fritz then jolts back awake in his office, with his hands covered in blood. So far, he's definitely not beating the mama decapitator allegations. The next scene shows us the silhouette of two Gmod dark RP looking ass cops at a crime scene. Based on the dumpster, it looks to be the same alleyway that Soldier killed Stalingrad in earlier. However, 
his body is mysteriously missing. So the cops decide to leave to go respond to a more important call elsewhere in the city. Some night, huh? If only you knew. We come back to Fritz washing his hands in the sink, filling it with blood in the process. This harkens back to the bad dream Jeremy recalled back in the prologue. There was blood all over the basin? It was horrible. Out of nowhere, Fritz gets grabbed around his neck by his own reflection, and gets his head smashed into the mirror, shattering its glass everywhere. Knocked to the floor, Fritz once again starts hearing knocking, this time followed by a file getting slipped under his door. However, when he looks outside, nobody's there. He goes back to his desk and digs in the folder, finding a key and what looks to be a series of creepy photos from whoever was stalking Jeremy. Jeremy in bed, Jeremy walking towards his house after Fritz dropped him off, and even one showing Jeremy as he first walked into Fritz's office. Fritz in frame and all. The phone on his desk then starts ringing, and he gets terrorized by the same phone call recording trick that taunted Jeremy earlier, with a cruel twist this time. Hey, Doc? Oh, thank God, Scout! Are you alright? I, I know it's late, but mind if I ask you something? What? Scout, where are you? You ever get the feeling like you're being watched? <laughs> what the hell have you done with him? Fritz seems very relieved to hear Jeremy's voice, once again showing that he isn't sure what happened at the scene of the beheading. This time, the recording the caller plays is from the prologue scene when Jeremy first entered Fritz's office, around the same time that photo of them would have been taken. The muffled screaming at the end of the call is very hard to make out, but Fritz immediately recognizes it as Jeremy and asks where he's been taken. In a flash of thunder, the phrase Conagher Slaughterhouse written in blood becomes visible on the wall. And that finally brings us into the third chapter. Here we come to the more important call that those cops left for in the last chapter, the crime scene at Jeremy's mom's house. And immediately we see that Jacques and Soldier, under the aliases Detective Mannix and Lieutenant Columbo, have snuck their way onto the crime scene. As Jacques takes pictures and tries to convince the police they belong there, Soldier begins ruffling through drawers, finding the termination notice Blue gave to Jeremy, notably specifying that Jeremy was let go for being defective. While I was editing this video, I realized I should probably go into more detail on this termination file, because it actually tells us a lot more about what's going on with with Jeremy than I initially thought. For one, it gives us the name of the Blue Team facility that oversaw Jeremy's termination, Oberhart Hospital, as well as the exact date he was let go, October 24th, just one week prior to the events of Emesis Blue. The file also directly explains why Jeremy was let go from the company. After going through the respawn machine, Jeremy was found unconscious, having suffered multiple seizures, incurring massive brain damage, and exhibiting symptoms of schizophrenia. His IQ after the fact was recorded at just 48, and he was diagnosed with brain atrophy, a condition indicating brain damage from a loss of neurons. He was thereby prescribed benzodiazepine, the generic name for the same diazepam pills we saw Fritz taking at the start of the movie. Earlier in the video, I somehow missed that in the living room scene, we do actually see Jeremy washing down these diazepam pills with some bonk. So it's not just Fritz taking these diazepam pills, but Jeremy as well. This file also spells out that Jeremy wasn't just moving in with his mom because he lost his job. He was just straight up not fit to live on his own due to his damaged psychological condition post respawn. As a result, his mother had to be given full legal guardianship over him, which is actually quite sad knowing how her story ends. All of this casts an even more interesting light on Jeremy and Fritz's relationship, and explains some of Fritz's apprehensive behavior toward him. Fritz is shown to be the doctor who signed off on this termination notice, so he definitely knows about the details of Jeremy's case and is likely spending time with him out of pity. The guilt Fritz feels from being complacent in the medical process that used and threw away his once close friend is definitely at least part of why he's shown to be so distraught all the time. It's tragic stuff. Jacques begins talking to an officer who was injured at the scene named Pei Lazari, a reference to Emesis Blue Blue's previously mentioned producer, Anton Pelazari, who also does the cop's voice acting. In fact, a lot of the voice acting in this film is done by Anton and the film's writer-director, Chad Payne. They honestly do a pretty good job of hiding their Australian accents most of the time. Anyways, here's what Officer Pelazari has to say. He had to be on drugs or something. I tried to bring him down, but he just kept coming at me. It was like a nightmare. Yeah, that poor bastard got his own sidearm in the gut. Putting our context clues together, Pelazari seems to have been the one who was knocking at the door when Fritz fainted at the murder scene earlier. Off screen, Fritz must have woken up and attacked Officer Pelazari before making a run for it, escaping back to his office with Pelazari's blood still on his hands. The whole conversation is interrupted as another officer barges in to tell the police chief that an officer with the unit number 187 was found dead in a dumpster. However, despite what the cops might be thinking, this was not another victim of Fritz. 187 is actually the number of the unit that Soldier sent out after The Undertaker earlier, before we heard his muffled, tortured screams over the radio. 
After killing that officer, Undertaker seems to have driven him off and disposed of him, with the cops only just now finding him. However, going forward, there's only one lead they managed to squeeze out of Pei Lazari as he bleeds. Ah! I'm telling you! How did he escape? What was he driving? Look, I think you've asked enough questions here, pal. Ambulance! See, look, he needs a doctor, so why don't you just... No, he was driving a goddamn ambulance. And when Jacques comes across a bloody bone saw at the scene, him and Soldier decide it's time to start tailing Fritz. We come back to Fritz as him and his previously mentioned ambulance finally arrive at the destination he's been told Jeremy is being held at, Conagher Slaughterhouse. It seems that this place is the Emesis Blue Universe's very dark and twisted take on Two Fort, or at least the red half of it. Fritz himself being blue, it definitely seems like he's entering enemy territory here. This is the place from his nightmares, the site of the demented respawn machine from the prologue, and the location a good chunk of the film will take place in going forward. Fritz walks across the bridge as he's watched from the field by what seems like some kind of sniper scope. We can see what looks like the Undertaker's black hearse from earlier burning right outside one of the entrances. Once Fritz makes it across, he witnesses blood dripping down from the building's downspout, communicating to him and the viewer that this place houses some serious evil. Unfortunately for our German friend, the bridge behind him was made in China. And as it collapses, he's left with no other option but to head inside. We then cut back to Jacques and the soldier, who have now made their way to Fritz's office and have begun searching for clues regarding the briefcase stolen from them, the murders of Jeremy's mom in Unit 187, and the whereabouts of Fritz. However, the place is pretty uninviting. Jacques observes the same creep shots from the folder Fritz was given earlier. In this context, though, he probably assumes they were taken by Fritz himself. He then catches a glimpse of the Conagher Slaughterhouse writing, while Soldier describes the aftermath of Fritz's freaky scene in the mirror earlier. Storms cut the power. Mirrors shattered. There's blood all over the sink. Must have been a fight or something. Ah! My god. It's his latest victim. It's a model, you idiot. They come across Fritz's Valium pills, and Soldier tells a pretty interesting anecdote before the phone rings. You know, it made me take a bunch of this stuff. Said I was seeing things. And did the medication work? I don't know. I never took any of it. The way Soldier handles the phone call trick compared to Fritz and Jeremy is also pretty amusing. Hello? Hello? Who is this? Who am I? Who the hell are you? Who is this? What? It's him. Listen to me, punk. You're not gonna think this is funny when I strangle you to death with your own stethoscope. Who is this? It's the voice of God, you son of a bitch, and I'm coming for you! I gotta say, I think Fortress Films did a great job faithfully writing Soldier into a horror film in a way that doesn't subtract from the atmosphere or feel out of character. Anyways, with that, Soldier and Jacques head out to follow after Fritz to the Conagher Slaughterhouse. Speaking of, what's going on there? With the front doors closed, Fritz uses a barrel and the rainwater pipe to just barely climb his way onto the sniper bay of the slaughterhouse, the pipe collapsing beneath him at the last second. Regaining his composure, he begins hearing Jeremy's screams in the distance. <sighs> Following the noise, he makes his way toward the main spawn of Two Fort, just for a door to close behind him, locking him in. Huh. Huh. Fritz narrowly escapes what looks to be a revived and juiced up version of Stalingrad from earlier, which I suppose explains why his body wasn't present at the crime scene when the cops arrived. Hearing more god-awful screams from the depths of the basement, Fritz then does a prayer motion, which is the first hint the movie gives us that Fritz is the same Christian medic seen at the end of Spy's Disguise. Unfortunately, Stalingrad punches the wall really good or something and sends Fritz tumbling down the stairs, destroying his medigun. He carries it forward with him anyway, dedicated to his duty of healing. If you thought the renovated metal floor of the main spawn entrance area was weird, the intel the basement here is even stranger. Hooks hanging from the ceiling, chairs and statues and jukeboxes, all baked in an ominous red lighting. I noticed that there's another M engraving on the wall here too. Leaving his medigun on a desk, Fritz grabs a wrench to protect himself and notices a ball. Jeremy's ball. The same one he was playing with before he got abducted. Once again faced with an M, we see exactly where the muffled screams of Jeremy have been coming from. A chained up coffin. Fritz notices the lock on the coffin's chain, then remembers the key he found in the weird folder earlier. He takes it out and goes to rescue his old friend, untying him and letting him loose. However, the response he gets is not the one you'd hope for after risking your life to save a friend. Wait, Scout! I'm trying to help you! If I had a gun, I'd shoot you, you sick bastard! In a delirious stupor, Jeremy runs away from his savior right into the most predictable sentry spot on all of Two Fort. Then we see its operator, an engineer named Maynard Conagher. As he sets his wrangler down, we see his brother Zed Conagher sitting at the table. If you have trouble remembering who's who, just know Maynard is the fat one. 
These two characters' names are references to the serial killer and rapist duo from Pulp Fiction, who abduct the character Butch in one of that film's most gruesome scenes. More importantly, they are the namesake and presumably the operators of the hellish place that is the Conagher Slaughterhouse. As Jeremy writhes in pain from his gunshot wounds, Zed laughs. He look lost, boy. Zed punches Maynard for letting Jeremy get loose. Jeremy spits in Zed's face, and then gets dragged away while Fritz watches in silent horror. Still trying to save Jeremy, Fritz makes a dash behind the intel desk to grab Maynard's Wrangler, but he's outnumbered and needs to stay low until the brothers are both distracted. Jeremy's screams of agony intensify as Maynard comes up to the desk. Then, the scene cuts. We come back to Jacques and Soldier as they pull up to the slaughterhouse in pursuit of Fritz. However, before Soldier gets a chance to rocket jump over the creek, Jacques slaps the rocket launcher out of his hand and accidentally blows up their car. Now, just like Fritz, they're both trapped at the slaughterhouse. And whoever was scoping out Fritz earlier hears the noise of the explosion and immediately takes a shot, with Soldier saving Jacques by tackling him into the ravine. Back in the intel room, music plays from a radio as Maynard grabs a beer and goes back to lean against his sentry. Fritz finally goes to reach for the Wrangler, but just before he can grab it, the phone on the table starts ringing forcing him into retreat. Maynard answers the phone, expecting a call from his brother. Hey, Dell, you haven't called me in a while. How's Dust Bowl working out, brother? Dust Bowl is gone. Gone? You heard me. There's nothing left of it. How? We're still trying to figure that out. It doesn't look good. What about my little brother? Is he all right? Listen, they're coming up the slaughterhouse now. Should you please get you secure? Sure. They always make it. I swear to God, if anything happens to my brother, I'm gonna... Shut up and listen to me. Forget the death subject. I think we've been compromised. You're so goddamn inconsiderate. Shut up! Can you get out? Yeah, who knows how? Look, when are you gonna be back? We shouldn't have to deal with this. Don't let the briefcase out of your sight. And what about my brother? <laughs> Whoever picks up instead informs him that Dust Bowl, where his little brother has apparently been staying at, has been destroyed. And this is our second Spies Disguise tie-in. It turns out that Zed and Maynard are not only brothers, but they also have another brother named Dell. And that Dell is none other than the same Red Engineer named Dell who was killed in the Spies Disguise movie, wherein the entire Red team got wiped out by the Mecha Spy with the surrounding area left in ruins. This call is someone directly informing Maynard about the events that took place in Spies Disguise. Unfortunately for Maynard, his brother is dead. And the guy who answers the phone instead is a bit of an asshole. More concerned about the briefcase on the counter than anything else. The briefcase on the counter that- Hey, wait a minute! That's the briefcase from the first chapter. The one that Jacques and Soldier lost when the Undertaker pistol whipped them and bounced with it. I guess the Undertaker must have crashed his car outside and left it here. Maynard grabs his Wrangler and goes back to play a song on a nearby piano. The song in question is apparently Blackbird by the Beatles. People really want to dig into the significance of this, but from what I can tell, it's just a song about the 1960s civil rights movement, and there's not really anything tying it to the themes of the movie or this scene. So I think it's probably just used because it's a song from the 60s that makes sense in the setting, for the most part. Fritz unplugs the telephone and begins wrapping it around his hands, then starts trying to strangle Maynard with it in an ambush. However, Maynard clocks him with the unplugged phone, and as soon as a hand-to-hand -hand fight begins, Fritz is quickly outmatched, beaten to a pulp, and then promptly shot in the chest with a double barrel. Maynard enjoys the silence after the kill, turning around and opening up a disposal hatch, preparing to throw out Fritz's body. However, while Maynard isn't looking, the impossible happens. All the bullet holes and injuries Fritz just sustained miraculously heal up, as his body begins to emit a holy blue glow, and he comes back to life. In that scene where Officer Pei Lazari describes how he was attacked, we heard what Fritz is capable of when his eyes turn red and he blacks out with violent rage. Now let's see what Fritz can do when his opposite side comes out, when he's brought back with blue eyes and a generous helping of righteous anger. Fritz sneaks sneaks up on Maynard and smacks him in the face with a bottle, then stabs him and smushes his body into the piano repeatedly. We also find out that the Conagher brothers have no eyes underneath their goggles, which is both a freaky visual that begs the question as to whether these guys are victims of respawn machine defects too, and also a direct reference to the 1990 film Jacob's Ladder. And finally, Fritz dumps Maynard down the same disposal hatch that Maynard was just planning to throw him down. Now, before I continue this scene, a lot of people in the community have long been confused as to why the hell Fritz suddenly just came back from the dead here, and I think I actually do have an answer for this. I personally believe it's because of that briefcase resting on the counter that was just mentioned in Maynard's phone call. There's been a lot of speculation as to what the briefcase symbolizes, some drawing more parallels to Pulp Fiction and the suitcase scene in that film. But here's where I get to reveal to you guys an Emesis Blue cheat code. One of the things Fortress Films offers on their Patreon, which you should definitely subscribe to, is an official screenplay of Emesis Blue. Now, I'm going to try to avoid referencing it too much in this video, since it is meant to be an incentive for their donors. But being a current patron of them and having flipped through it, it would be incredibly hard for me to do this
this video without at least mentioning a few of the things it reveals to us. One of them is the contents of the briefcase. At least, sorta. The screenplay tells us in very plain English in a later scene that this briefcase contains a respawn core. What exactly that is isn't super clear, but knowing that that briefcase has a tie to the freaky paranormal respawn technology makes this scene make a lot more sense in my eyes. I think Fritz comes back because he dies right next to that respawn core, and his proximity to it revitalizes him with supernatural powers to allow him a second chance to avenge Jeremy. Zed comes back into the intel room to see what the hell Maynard is doing that's making so much noise, but he instead comes face to face with Fritz, and we get one of the most satisfying scenes in the whole movie. What the hell are you- Now that ain't a toy, son. Put it down. Now. Now don't do nothing stupid, boy. You got no idea who you're dealing with. <laughs> Fritz grabs the Respawn Core briefcase on his way out, but stops to finish Zed off with the same sawed off that Maynard used on him earlier. With all three of the Conagher brothers officially wiped out, Fritz is given time to relax, but instead hears a distorted voice echoing in his head. <laughs> This is actually Jeremy's last words to him played in reverse. Falling to the floor, his momentary superpowers fleeting, Fritz spots the sight of Jeremy's bloody torture and takes a moment to breathe and process the trauma of losing his friend. And that's a wrap on chapter three, which is pretty much the last normal chapter in the entire film. So buckle up boys, cause shit is about to start getting weird. Chapter 4 opens and we come back to Soldier and Jacques after they dived into the ravine to avoid that sniper in the distance, now advancing further into the sewers of the slaughterhouse. And here we start to see their conflict really come to a boil. Have a listen. Back in the war, we would spend weeks stuck in wet dugouts like this, with water up to your ankles. They were built only six feet wide, but they could go on for miles. Kill me now. You have no comprehension of what you're getting into. I have a pretty damn good idea. We should have called for backup. And what the hell do you think I'm doing? I just saved you from a bullet to the head. And who was it that told them we were coming, hmm? Who's been killing our leads and getting the police involved? You have compromised this entire operation. What about all those pictures? That's evidence we can use, right? They were in the car, you idiot. Now I have nothing because of you, you stupid bastard, you amateur. I hope you can swim because you're going right back out the way you came. You're gonna shoot me? We're done. I don't care what wretched battalion you think you come from, you are not coming with me. You shot one of your own before? Get out of my way. Archibald teach you that? There's a few things to read from this conversation. Jacques seemingly blind bitterness and unfair anger toward the man who just saved his life like five seconds ago. Jacques' complete disbelief of Soldier's wartime anecdote, and the first hint the movie gives us that Jules Archibald is an untrustworthy character. But before the conversation can finish playing out, we find out that the same red sniper who just fired on the duo outside has taken advantage of the two squabbling to move to a new spot by the stairs, making his presence known by cocking his rifle, then firing another shot towards Soldier as he peeks the corner. Soldier fumbles and drops his rifle rocket launcher just out of reach, but decides to take a bold risk to try and get it back. What are you, blind? Come on, right here. Take your mess. You think I didn't come prepared? How did you know he wouldn't shoot you in the head? I didn't. Jacques and the soldier, putting their differences aside, advance on the injured red sniper. But soldier tells Jacques to let him bleed. This will later turn out to be, at least in my opinion, the first real blunder that soldier makes in this movie. After soldier steps up the stairs, we hear a gun cock from behind him and he drops his rocket launcher to the floor. As he turns around, it's revealed that the person holding him at gunpoint is none other than the same freaky Marble Hornets looking pyro we saw in Jeremy's house before he was kidnapped, the Butcher. Soldier falls to his knees, then Jacques does the stupidest thing imaginable. Okay, now pull a revolver on the guy with the submachine gun.
Now injured and alone with the butcher, Jacques reaches for his revolver. Unfortunately for him, it turns out that while he was distracted, the sniper that Soldier just spared took all the bullets out of the gun. And now Jacques is in for a world of hurt. We see Soldier from the other side of the door that closed between him and Jacques, desperately trying to lift it back up. This shows he genuinely does feel bad about leaving his partner behind, even though he was being a massive dick. This is also the last we'll see of Jacques for a long time. Now that we're alone with the soldier, it's probably a decent time to mention the fact that he's pretty much the only main character Emesis Blue doesn't outright assign a real first or last name to, which is peculiar. A lot of TF2 fans like to refer to the soldier in this movie as Jane, a reference to the soldier's name in TF2's official lore, since it's a bit weird to have a name for everyone else but him. However, neither the credits of the film, the screenplay, nor any other official resource I can find ever refer to the soldier in the film by this name, just as Soldier. It seems Soldier not being given a real name is an intentional choice from the filmmakers, and I think it's actually a good one. Does it not make sense for one of the main characters in a movie about people being used like nameless objects to be nameless himself? Soldier hears two people talking in the distance. One sounds like a demo man, and the other sounds like another soldier. Before he gets a chance to eavesdrop, he gets startled by a freaky scout monster named the Creature making strange noises underneath a flickering light. Soldier grabs a crowbar on some Gordon Freeman shit and smashes his way through a nearby wooden door. But the noise alerts the other soldier in the distance who advances on him with a flashlight. Our soldier then chucks his crowbar at the other soldier and makes a run for it, only to be met with some kind of weird occult portal lined with blood and skeletons. With the Creature on his tail though, he's not given much choice but to head into it. Remember how I said shit gets really weird in this chapter? Well, here we go. As Soldier walks into the weird occult portal thing, the bodies of World War II era infantry float up from out of the ground, and he's transported into those same trenches he was just describing to Jacques back in the sewer. Visions of tanks, explosions, and barbed wire lined with bodies leave him in a state of shock. He looks to the right and spots something peculiar, The Undertaker playing chess with Fritz. Then, on his left, he gets a message from Jacques. Soldier, what are you doing? There's something for you here. Seemingly being taunted by all of his worst memories and guilt, things come to a head as Soldier witnesses a young infantryman, a scout as a matter of fact, gets shot right in the dome by a sniper. However, as Soldier goes to brace his body, the scout begins to twitch and morph into the same monster who was just tailing him, the creature. Soldier gets up and makes a run for it, then winds up right back in the rainy two-fort courtyard as if nothing just happened. Needing some reprieve from all the insanity, Soldier takes a second to sip from his flask. Now, some people like to interpret this last scene as nothing but a PTSD flashback, but I'd say there's something more going on here. The slaughterhouse has weaponized Fritz's guilt over Jeremy, and now it's seemingly weaponized Soldier Survivor's guilt against him as well. It's almost Silent Hill-esque in a way. Something is seriously wrong with this place. And at this point, with the freaky monsters and briefcase that magically revives you, I'm comfortable saying it's definitely something paranormal. And speaking of paranormal, after noticing the aftermath of Fritz's encounter with Stalingrad earlier, Soldier gets alerted by a demo man, and we hear a weirdly familiar conversation. You're gonna finish that? Hey. I'm looking for Jules Archibald. Who's asking? His rescue. Fred, you're gonna be disappointed. I wanna know what the hell is going on here. I don't know. That's probably this week by now. I've already lost one man, I'm not gonna lose another. Then you're a dead man. <laughs> you haven't lost both eyes at Cyclops, so tell me what you've seen. Gonna go, brothers. They run the joint, but this is red territory. Not anymore. Who's the guy you were just talking to? What guy? I don't have time for this. Wait. You gotta get me out of here. Why the hell should I? There's a whole stash of guns locked in a keep upstairs. I can get you in. Soldier's got a new sidekick to replace Jacques, a one-armed red demo man who is being held prisoner by Zed and Maynard from earlier. This character, just like Stalingrad, is only referred to in the screenplay and credits as Soldier's nickname for him, Cyclops. In real TF2 lore, the war update and comic established an undying brotherhood between demo man and Soldier, and I think it's really cool that Nemesis Blue reimagines that connection in a new, much darker context. Since Cyclops assumes Archibald to be dead, he and Soldier establish a new primary objective, head upstairs to get their hands on some weapons in a locked spawn room. However, completing a really bizarre time loop that only makes that war flashback scene even more confusing, Soldier gets whacked in the face with a crowbar by his past self, and once again comes face to face with the creature. But this time, there's no running. And oh my god, this part is fucking unsettling on a first watch through. Also, seizure warning. 
Trusting Cyclops out of lockup, Soldier carries him on his back up the stairs, but gets tripped and is forced to kill the creature with a meaty thwack to the head. It's a cool scene. After collecting themselves, Cyclops makes good on his promise and gets Soldier into the spawn room to nab some weapons. Cyclops' remark that this place is no longer red territory is interesting, by the way. Especially given how he's red and clearly being held prisoner, and how all we've come across since we've gotten here are zombified and monstrous versions of red team mercenaries. It is the Conagher Slaughterhouse, after all, and it definitely seems like Zed and Maynard have been using it for some demented ass shit. This scene is also where we finally start seeing exactly how this whole plot ties into the respawn machine we saw at the beginning. This line that Soldier hears from a tape recording he picked up off the hands of a dead sniper reveals to us one of Emesis Blue's heaviest inspirations. It helps us figure out a lot about what's going on in its plot. So before we get to the really cool action scene coming up, let me explain. That line we just heard Sniper repeat is from The Jaunt, a short story penned by Stephen King in 1981 about a fictional teleportation technology called The Jaunt. The story is told from the perspective of a 24th century father educating his stupid children about The Jaunt's invention as the family gets ready to use it to travel to Mars. The twist is that while The Jaunt is capable of instantly transporting all physical matter that goes through it in an instant, it's a tricky technology to use on humans, because for any living being's consciousness, the process takes an unfathomably long amount of time, driving them completely insane by the time the teleportation is complete. The line, it's eternity in there we saw at the start of Emesis Blue, is lifted directly from a death row prison inmate we hear about in the story, who gets sent through the jaunt wide awake, then dies of a heart attack right after he steps out. In the story, humanity has mostly solved this problem by simply knocking everyone who uses the jaunt out with a sleeping gas, allowing them to sleep through the eternal process and come out the other end just fine. However, in the story, one of the main character's stupid kids decides to hold his breath before going through to see what all the fuss is about, and comes out the other end screaming about how it's longer than you think before clawing his own eyes out. Some people have taken this to mean that the process of jaunting is literally longer than it takes for a conscious mind to think of every thought that can possibly be thought. The process of teleporting literally taking longer than you can think for. And that's pretty terrifying. It's been well understood in the community for a while that this quote from the sniper's recording is a direct reference that implies the process of respawning to be basically just as torturous as jaunting. But something I don't think people realize is just how deep the inspiration here goes. For one, these zombies Soldier and Cyclops are about to fight in the next scene are directly referred to as jaunts in Emesis Blue's screenplay. And for two, what does the respawn machine do? Remember, it doesn't clone you or heal you, it simply tries to revert you back to how you were before you died. Now remember what the jaunt from that story does, it advances time forward on its subject. So what if the respawn machine was an inverted parallel of the jaunt that instead reverts time backwards on its subject, as a band-aid fix for death. Remember the effects when the machine screws up. The subjects are totally psychologically destroyed, and they blabber those same exact phrases about how the process is longer than you think. It makes sense that the process of going back in time on the body and mind would presumably be just as bad, if not worse, than the process of advancing it forward like the jaunt does. One reason I believe this theory is because when we see the respawn core technology bring Fritz back to life in the intel room, we see the wounds and even seams in his clothes completely sealing up, reverting to a point as if they were never even there. The effects of his respawn spawn don't resemble any form of actual organic healing, they resemble time reversal. We even see the pool of blood on the ground flow directly back into his body. This also, I think, ties into that scene we just saw of Soldier interacting with the time loop. The respawn machine, now malfunctioning, is not only spewing out tormented monsters, it's also spreading anomalies through space-time. All right, now that that's out of the way, let's get back to the story. The jaunts on the floor are woken up after Cyclops smashes open the door to the armory with Soldier's crowbar, but not before he and the Soldier pick up some new guns and a grenade. Then the jaunts rise to their feet, and we get a slick looking Resident Evil reference. Our heroes try to escape, but are trapped inside by the shuttered door, and forced to kill off all the jaunts one by one in one of the best action scenes of the entire movie. The doors to the spawn room finally open, and Cyclops and Soldier are once again met with the open air. Cyclops begins trying to bust open the same door that sealed Fritz into the slaughterhouse, but to no avail. Stop it! Don't you get it? We're trapped. He's trying to kill us. Thank you. 
This bit is interesting. For one, we once again get our attention drawn to the Helix Company, which the intro specified as the manufacturers of the respawn machine. It seems that Zed and Maynard renovated this place with Helix's help, and that begs some questions about their involvement with this whole respawn machine freak show. Second of all, Soldier seems to think that someone in particular, on the viewing end of that security camera, wants the two of them dead. He probably thinks it's Fritz, but based on how we've seen the slaughterhouse victimize Fritz as well, it definitely doesn't seem so. Maybe, just maybe, there's someone else involved with Helix who wants them dead? We finally come back to Fritz as he lays his dead friend Jeremy back in the same coffin he just fought so hard to rescue him from. Then he turns around and comes face to face with a new foe, a red medic with a big old stitch down his forehead called the Surgeon. Thinking fast, Fritz makes good use of his broken medigun from earlier. <laughs> Fritz heads through the door the surgeon apparently came from and sees a TV. He tunes in and sees a recording which reveals that the reason Stalingrad reappeared to chase Fritz earlier, despite being shot and killed by Soldier, is because the surgeon revived him using some kind of serum, which turned out to be a really bad idea. Normally we have papers signed before doing these things, but uh, uh no matter. The hell with Helix, you old fools. They don't deserve this. My God. Oh! This scene reveals that the workers at the slaughterhouse were doing medical slash respawn experiments underneath Helix's nose and behind their backs, which is actually kind of important and might be one of the reasons the respawn machine here started screwing up in the first place. Note the date and time on the recording, by the way. It's now just past midnight and no longer Halloween. Anyways, Fritz turns around from the TV and comes face to face with the hulking Stalingrad once again. And he's only gotten bigger since we last saw him. This is the same thing he muttered to Jacques at the start of the movie. Builder's League. Fritz makes yet another run for it, and lucky for him, Stalingrad gets distracted by the injured surgeon who's still writhing around on the floor. Hiding just around the corner, Fritz seems to accidentally catch Stalingrad's attention once more as we cut back to Cyclops and Soldier. Soldier walks back out to the courtyard and notices that the body of the creature he killed is gone. Where the fuck did it go? Just then, Fritz begins yelling and banging on a door separating him from the two. Hello! Someone help me! By, I guess, hiding in the corner, Fritz manages to barely slip the sight of Stalingrad, who then busts the door open as our protagonists finally meet. However, the occasion is hardly anything to celebrate. Shoot him! Shoot him! Soldier and Cyclops tussle with Stalingrad, but wind up stuck when a headless statue falls over on top of them, and things start to feel hopeless for our heroes. However, the elevator Stalingrad came out of earlier mysteriously opens, and Fritz musters some of his courage to yell out and distract Stalingrad. Hey! He gets grabbed up, but manages to disorient and injure Stalingrad with a screwdriver. In the time this buys, Soldier and Cyclops manage to get unstuck and rush into the elevator, and all three manage to narrowly escape Stalingrad's wrath, in part thanks to the creature from earlier somehow coming back from the dead and tackling him, which I think is funny. Even in weird mutant monster form, the Scout and Heavy have an undying rivalry. After our three heroes recoup in the elevator, Fritz begins sobbing uncontrollably, and Soldier offers him a cigarette to cheer him up. With a puff, Fritz's sobbing turns to maniacal, demented laughter, and Soldier cracks a smile too. Cyclops doesn't seem to get what's so funny, and the last shot pans out to show us that we're only descending further into the darkness going forward. To begin chapter 5, which is by far the longest chapter in the entire movie, we flash back to a time before Emesis Blue began. We see Jacques and, for the first time in the movie, Jules Archibald in the flesh, both preparing to execute three blue team mercenaries for a quote-unquote treason back in Dust Bowl. While the way Jacques has treated Soldier throughout the film has made it obvious he isn't the nicest guy, here it becomes clear how self-centered he's always been, killing these helpless people expressly to further his own career. What's it going to take, Corporal? I want a new car. Done! Anything else? My own personal assistant. Anything you like, Corporal. How about a vacation, old boy? 
I think I burned it. It pretty much confirms that he's an irredeemable jackass who only wants to rescue Jules because he's the ticket to a more comfortable life for himself. We also briefly see what appears to be Stalingrad in the background, though it's unclear if the corporal and his boss know he's even there. It is interesting though, given Jacques' remark earlier in the film implying that Stalingrad was a former blue team member. Jacques seems to be daydreaming about an old memory that fulfilled a power fantasy of his. But unfortunately, we cut back to his harsh reality. Him in the present day sat helplessly in the clutches of the butcher after being left behind by soldier an entire chapter ago. You could be forgiven for expecting him to be long dead by now, to be honest. Doused in gasoline with his mask removed, Jacques tries his best to threaten the maniac in front of him, who just straight up cannot be bothered to even react. Then the butcher removes its own mask and steps back into the shadows, flicking on a lighter to briefly reveal its disfigured face, which should be very familiar to most of you who watch this channel. The head the filmmakers used here for the butcher's face is from a model called Corpse 01, which is a Half-Life 2 asset that uses a forensics photograph of a real dead burnt body as part of its texture. Duh, it's a real dead body. Duh. As the butcher shows Jacques his dark and gritty secret, we return back to Soldier, Cyclops, and Fritz as their elevator finally reaches everyone's favorite part of Two Fort, the fucked up prison dungeon. God, so many fun memories doing the conga down here and feeding friendly Pudis heavy sandwich. Soldier is the first one to break the silence, questioning Fritz's involvement in all this since he's the reason he wound up here in the first place. You don't work for the Conigers, do you? I killed the Conigers. Who gave you that order? They tried to kill me. Is that enough? Soldier spots the respawn core Fritz is carrying with him, noticing it to be the same briefcase that the Undertaker stole back from him and Jacques earlier. That doesn't belong to you. I can explain. Fritz's distant attitude is clearly off-putting to Soldier, who orders him to stay put in the elevator and heads off with the Cyclops to gossip like a girl. The two talk about how little they trust Fritz as a new companion, which doesn't really matter because they'll hardly talk to each other for the rest of the movie anyway. They pass by a bunch of cells with messages carved into the walls, including another spotting of that damn M. Then they hear sobbing in the distance. It turns out that after his kidnapping, Jules Archibald was taken here to the Conagher Slaughterhouse, much like Jeremy. And he's not dead like Cyclops assumed earlier. Soldier, without much help from Jacques, has successfully located Jules Archibald, who is relieved, but honestly comes off a bit ungrateful. Oh, thank God! A rescue! You have to get me out of here before I contract something. Are you injured, sir? I'm about to have a heart attack. Now, are you going to stand there, or can you unlock this bloody door? Ha <laughs> ha! You're right where you belong, you fat crooked bastard! Smart bloody leper, aren't you? Soldier, why are you dragging this corpse around? What the hell this man called me? He's been handy, sir. He's got none left. Are you conspiring with the enemy, soldier? I'm just trying to help, sir. Then stop wasting my time! This squeaky ghost chair distracts Soldier and Jules while Cyclops runs off to a strange door labeled Bar. Meanwhile, Fritz contemplates, uh, using his gun on himself to escape his dire situation. However, he rejects his darker impulses and decides it'd be more fun to use his gun on the elevator mirror instead. The sound of the shot Fritz fires once again distracts Soldier, who whirls around to see that Jules has somehow disappeared entirely from the cell he was just in. Now Soldier is completely alone. And as he turns, he's mortified to spot a hanging corpse in the cell across from Jules. If you brighten this image, it actually turns out to be a vision of yet another World War II era infantryman. Returning to Cyclops, we cut to see that the bar sign he followed was actually one to a laboratory. The movie then fades into an extended reference to The Shining as Cyclops sits down at a bar, his missing eye replaced by a new light blue one. His bartender? Dell. Yes, the same Dell who died in Dust Bowl in the Spies Disguise film, and whose concerned brothers also died in the intel room at the hand of Fritz not long ago. He looks a little different than he did last time we saw him, though. I just chalked this up to them trying to make the Shining reference more obvious. We then once again hear the same line from Stephen King's The Jaunt story we heard earlier. Hello, Dell. Long night, eh? Longer than you think. Over a drink, Cyclops questions Dell what he's doing so far from Dust Bowl. I thought you were miles away, lad. Where you been hiding? Who says I've been hiding? Your brothers thought you were dead. <laughs> a relapse is a hell of a thing, ain't it? Too right. The two then begin discussing the respawn machine. Longer than you think. It is. Whoa. When they figured out how to bring us back, some of us would tell stories about what we saw on the other side. We saw old friends, family, mostly strangers. I spoke to my grandfather. He's been dead for 30 years. What'd he tell you? 
It's eternity in there. Given that Cyclops is talking to someone who is definitely dead, and the fact that the bar he thought he saw wasn't real, it definitely seems like this scene depicts Cyclops either in or on his way to the afterlife. Either that or that drink Soldier gave him earlier was stronger than you think. Ah! It turns out that after running off in the dungeon, Fritz has accidentally discovered Conagher Slaughterhouse's actual respawn machine terminal, seemingly led there by a strange silhouette in the hallway. The terminal itself looks suspiciously similar to the monolith from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Fritz looks deep inside the machine, and sees what looks like his fallen friend Jeremy deep inside it. He goes to reach out toward him, instead accidentally activating the terminal. It reads, Helix Technologies, respawn terminal, running startup program, localizing data, searching, one file found. Warning, file corruption detected. Proceed, yes or no? It turns out it wasn't just a vision. Fritz is looking at the same template that Blue used to clone his dead friend time and time again prior to his termination. Or at least some version of his dead friend. As Fritz contemplates the risk of using the respawn machine to bring a potentially injured or corrupted version of Jeremy back into the world, the ghost of Jeremy's mother stands ominously behind him. Catching back up with the soldier, we see he's found his way into his own strange location. This time the war room from another one of Stanley Kubrick's films, Dr. Strangelove. A reference crafted using a modified version of the Blue Team spawn room on the actual TF2 map Coldfront. In Nemesis Blue, however, it's the Conagher Slaughterhouse's command room. And it's here where Soldier listens in on a very revealing taped phone call between Jules Archibald and Blue Tark Man about the respawn machine. Yes, I've been calling about the project we discussed. Oh, the pregnancy machine. No, not the pregnancy machine, the other one. Yes, there's been a slight hiccup, so to speak. The respawn machine works. It technically works. Blue Tark, however... Uh, no. You see, that's the problem. They say we've lost about 90% of the test subjects. What? I, I know you're upset, Blue Tark, but the good news is we found about 10 of them that are respawn compatible. Uh, hold on a moment. What the hell is going on? He shot himself? Oh, bloody hell. Just throw him in the pit with the others. Excuse me, hi, Blue Talk. You promised me an army, Archibald. Well, think of the money you'll save. Mercenaries are very cheap these days. With a respawn machine on every front line, there will be no worry. You'll surely win this war by the end of the financial year. That's not allow a respawn gap. The respawn gap? You must be joking. Blue Talk, I, I really must be going now. Hey, listen, would you be interested in a new heart, liver, or spleen? We have about 800,000 corpses on site, and we're not really sure what to do with them. Oh, I'll take one of each. I see. Then the two-faced Archibald calls up Blue Tark's brother and business rival Redmond, and seems to prepare to give him the same exact offer. Redmond, Jules Archibald, I have a proposition for you. This scene gives us the most exposition we've yet had in the movie, and it reveals a couple of really important things. One, it reveals that Jules is the one responsible for the widespread use of the respawn machine technology, and therefore is a big part of why Soldier and all of our other characters have gone through so much torment in the movie thus far. Every monstrous respawn defect, every jaunt, everything we see in the slaughterhouse is a direct result of Jules' advancement of this nightmarish technology. Two, this scene demonstrates to us the sheer misery and death that the respawn machine exudes. We hear that its experiments have produced over 800 100,000 corpses, which for reference is about as many as are estimated to have died in the Rwandan genocide. I would imagine that if this were the real world, this would make Jules complicit in at least one war crime of some kind. We even get a cute but morbid gag about TF2's elusive 10th class, insinuating that he did at one point exist, but turned a gun on himself because of how horrific the conditions of the respawn machine are. And three, this scene makes it clear that Jules is trying to keep both sides of the red and blue conflict stocked up for an endless war, just so he can keep profiting off of it. He almost reads as a personification or even critique of the military-industrial complex in that way. Almost. After learning all this, Soldier asking Jacques back in the sewer if he learned his treacherous and selfish ways from Archibald is making a lot more sense. With how untrustworthy this scene clearly shows Archibald to be, it even puts into question the legitimacy of his quote-unquote kidnapping, though we'll hear more about that a little later in the film. We then get a brief scene of Fritz, where he chooses to activate the respawn machine to bring back Jeremy. But something goes wrong. We hear a scream from inside the machine, and then we get yet another reference to The Shining. In fact, a rerun of the one we saw during Fritz's nightmare at the start of the movie, with heaps of blood pouring out of the respawn machine machine door. We cut back again to the soldier in the command room, as he's suddenly shot at by the same red sniper he blew up earlier. Except, not quite. Now he's wearing black. And from here on out, the screenplay starts referring to him as the Hunter. I also noticed that the hat the Hunter wears is the same as that of the Christian Brutal Sniper TF2 freak I mentioned at the start of the video. However, I looked it up and the hat is apparently also just an official Halloween cosmetic in TF2, so I'm not sure if the reference is intentional. The Hunter licks a shot off in the soldier's leg, paying him back for the one he lost, which we can see has now been replaced by a metal rod. The soldier retreats into 
the same laboratory we saw Cyclops wander into earlier, while the Hunter goes to make a phone call. And who picks up but the Butcher, who makes the same mistake thousands of players do every day by turning his back on a spy. While he's distracted, Jacques activates his Invis watch and disappears into the air, chucking a gas can at the Butcher before blowing him away with his revolver. It's a satisfying scene, but because Jacques is kind of a dumbass, he then drops a cigarette right on top of the gasoline he just spilled and manages to light himself on fire, then plunging back into the two fort sewers to extinguish himself. Returning to Fritz, we see him curled up on the floor in front of the respawn machine. Was that scene from earlier of him trying to respawn Jeremy and making blood pour out of the machine real? It seems like it wasn't, because the floor is now bone dry, and Fritz doesn't appear any bloodier than he already was. It seems Fritz's hallucinations and visions are only getting worse. Jeremy's baseball appears from nowhere and rolls into Fritz's foot, prompting him to once again investigate the machine. Opening up the shutter, he somehow finds himself back in Jeremy's home, dinner still cooking in the oven. As he rounds the corner, expecting to see the body of Jeremy's mother, he instead sees one of the medical dividers from his clinic, and peering through, He sees the past. Trying to break free, he shoves the divider over and spills the box of tapes, just as we saw at the start of the movie. Fritz seems to have found himself in a time loop of his own, just like soldiers from earlier. This scene is actually a direct reference to the Christopher Nolan film Interstellar, which makes sense since that movie plays with the concept of time loops as well. After Jeremy and Fritz's past self step out of the room, Fritz tries once more to break the loop and chase after them, swinging the doors behind them open, again, just like we saw at the start of the movie. But instead of being able to talk to his past self or Jeremy, he instead gets time cooked and transported back to the scene of Jeremy's mother's murder. And we get a real horror show. Fritz sees another version of himself standing over her corpse. As he rises up, we see he's missing his eyes and many of his teeth, with blood pouring down his cheeks. One of the spookiest and most memorable shots in the entire film, in my opinion. Subscribe to Richter Overtime, or this man will visit you. Keep this shot in mind, by the way. It'll be kind of important later. You should be able to remember it pretty easily, because it's actually the film's 237th reference to The Shining. Fritz abruptly wakes up back in front of the respawn terminal, again bringing into question how much of what we've been seeing is at all real. In front of him is the Butcher, still on fire, slowly hobbling toward him like a slasher villain. Thinking fast, Fritz shoots the lock off of a door that just straight up wasn't there the last time we saw that spot, and flees into a massive church, complete with windows showing the night sky outside, despite how far below ground that elevator took him earlier. It's actually the same church we caught a glimpse of The Undertaker in way back in Chapter 2, when Fritz had that brief vision of himself being stuck in a coffin. He quickly ducks into a confessional booth to hide, looking up to see the solemn Vow Hippocrates statue and its Do Not Harm plaque. From the other side of the booth, somebody slides Fritz the cross necklace we saw him wear in Spy's Disguise, which he takes and wears for most of the film going forward. Having retreated into the laboratory while running from the Hunter, Soldier finds himself in a frozen cryo chamber storage, and makes a horrifying discovery. What the fuck, I'm a fucking clone? Now, as shocking as this cloning discovery may be to him, it probably isn't that crazy to anybody watching because of all that exposition I gave at the start of the video. Still though, imagine walking into some psychotic cult barn house, and then when you get to the bottom, you find a chamber full of frozen replicas of yourself. Spooky. Soldier discovers Cyclops, either dead or dying, on the floor, frozen in place in the sixth reference to a Kubrick film within the last 15 minutes of this movie. Soldier stares into both of his eyes. You know, it makes sense for him to have them both back in the afterlife dream sequence, but I have no idea why he's got him back in the real world now too. Somehow, Stalingrad appears yet again, even bigger, and seemingly unharmed from his battle with the scout creature earlier. Soldier pulls the pin on a grenade Cyclops was holding out for him before fleeing the room. Soldier might have outsmarted Stalingrad, but the Hunter returns and tries to hit him with a fancy laser-guided rocket launcher, just as Fritz puts on his new cross. The flaming butcher then rips Fritz from the confession booth, palming Fritz's face with his burning hands and maiming an M into his cheek. However, Fritz gains the upper hand when he gets his hands on a pistol and manages to shoot out both of the butcher's eyes, which I think is probably a reference to Halloween 2. He then seals the deal by chopping off the butcher's head with his own ax. And in one of the weirdest moments of the entire film, Fritz starts to hear applause. He looks up and sees the church pews lined with people in black suits and white masks clapping. What does it mean? I, uh, kinda don't know. <laughs> the best guess I can give you is that it represents the good side of Fritz's consciousness applauding him for triumphing over evil. But that feels a little cheap for how intently strange these ghostly apparitions are. It's probably the most bizarre scene in the entire film, in my opinion. Here's one thing I noticed. Fortress Film's Patreon includes two concept pieces that I think are from earlier drafts of this scene. And in them, we get a much clearer look at these guys' faces. More importantly, we get some file names. The image of Fritz is labeled Caligari, and the image of the masked men, Caligari Masks. As far as I can tell, this is a reference to an 
1920 German silent horror film called The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which looks to have been another one of Emesis Blue's major inspirations. It even appears amidst Fritz's VHS catalog that gets knocked over at the start of the movie. Wikipedia says that the film tells the story of an insane hypnotist who uses a brainwashed somnambulist to commit murders, which to me seems like it could have been an inspiration for the plot we followed between Fritz and The Undertaker. Somnambulist just means a sleepwalker, by the way. I had to look it up. But from what I've seen, there's not any scenes in The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari where a weird ghostly audience applauds a beheading. So if anyone watching has a better interpretation of this scene, I'm all ears in the comments. Anywho, we then finally catch up with Jules himself after he disappeared on Soldier in that prison dungeon earlier. He talks to his lawyer over the phone, whose name is Goldman. Some say him having a lawyer named Goldman is a reference to Saul Goodman. Uh, I don't know, maybe. Jules conveniently recaps much of what we learned from that phone recording earlier, and he and his lawyer even float the possibility of using the respawn machine as a means of escaping charges for his crimes. In full view of a security camera for any judge or jury who might happen to be watching. Now I've thought about it surely as a last resort, but if I can use it to disappear for a while, it's a chance I'll have to take. Jules then all but confirms that his entire kidnapping was staged to escape culpability for the horrors he unleashed using the respawn machine, before questioning what exactly these pills everyone in the movie seems to be taking are. And worse yet, I think this Valium is actually- Continue this call. Please deposit five cents. No oh, blast! <laughs> nah. Whatever Jules sees beyond the shutter is enough to send him running, right into the company of none other than Jacques. Jacques appears charred and blackened from his fire accident earlier, and from here on out in the screenplay, he's referred to as just the Smoker, a lot like the Red Sniper who transformed into the Hunter earlier. Jacques confronts Jules over his selfishness and reveals his charred body. It doesn't end well for Jules as Jacques goes full Joker mode. You've never cared about anyone but yourself, Coral. No, please, for God's sake. Well. There's no one here to protect you now. But I, I've given you everything you wanted. And I'm giving you exactly what you deserve. Soldier barges into a new room in the slaughterhouse basement and slams the door behind him. I really like this detail of him smacking the door in frustration afterward, clearly distraught that he couldn't save Cyclops, the closest thing he had to a good friend in this entire movie. He hits a button on the wall that starts a projector, playing a film from the Jules Archibald Foundation that goes further into how the respawn machine works, and reveals a few more interesting things to the soldier. I'm on? All right, fine. Hello again. If you're watching this, then I can say with complete certainty that you have survived respawn compatibility. Congratulations. If you're confused, allow me to explain. Before you were lawfully executed by the state, you signed a contract effectively donating your mortal remains to a medical trial. The good news is you're not on death row anymore, since you're technically already dead. Which also means you are now company property. But fear not. As promised, you all have a new job waiting for you when you get out. You are now ten of the strongest mercenaries money can buy, and your sacrifice will reward you in time. I'll see you all on the other side. The revelation that all of our mercenaries were once death row inmates is pretty shocking. It really makes you wonder what someone like Jeremy could have done to wind up scoring a life sentence. Soldier then looks over a few photos on a table, one confirming the existence of President Lyndon B. Johnson in the TF2 universe, and seemingly his compliance in the respawn machine conspiracy. Weirdly enough, this won't be the last real-world US president they implicate in this film's story. There's also a photo showing a man being executed in the same electric chair we spotted behind Archibald just a moment ago. There's a few more showing failed respawn machine incidents, including the two we saw in the opening scene of the film as well as a new one of someone who seems to have emerged from the machine on fire. Soldier picks up the final, upside-down photo to see himself getting shot in the head by none other than Jules himself, referencing an actual famous photo from the Vietnam War showing a Viet Cong captain's execution. You probably saw this photo in school. If there was ever an image to express to Soldier just how meaningless the life of him and all of his clones were to Archibald, this is it. It reveals pretty straightforwardly that Jules was never an ally of his at all. Just then, the hunter walks into the room, and now knowing what secrets the Soldier has uncovered, seems to give him an ominous and vague offer. You really want to die for that fat bastard? Don't you want to die for something worth dying for? Do you have any idea how long I've waited for this? Longer than you think. 
The hunter hears a door creak and turns to see the butcher's head peering around a corner. He starts heading towards him before Fritz drops its head, revealing he'd been using the same tactic as Jeremy's kidnappers earlier, then smashing his axe into the hunter in the film's final Shining reference. For now. Soldier and Fritz then quickly dispatch the hunter together, but not before he gives us one final cryptic line. See you on the other side. Fucking gruesome. A film suddenly starts playing from the projector. It's from a company called Emesis Pharmaceuticals, a presumed collaborator of the Archibald Foundation and Helix Industries. The film shows human bodies flowing through coiled red tubes, much like blood cells and veins. It seems Emesis Pharmaceutical played a big part in the medical element of managing the respawn machine. While distracted, Fritz then gets knocked out, which makes you really wonder what happened to the soldier in that five second window between the film on the wall starting and now. Anyways, with that, the longest section of the film finally wraps up, and we fade into the penultimate chapter. Chapter. Fritz and Soldier both wake up in a room labeled as the Execution Floor, sitting at a table face to face with their kidnapper, who turns out to be none other than the Smoker. Clearly still believing Fritz and the Undertaker to be one and the same, the Smoker points his gun at Fritz and orders him to open his Respawn Corps briefcase, but Fritz refuses. Soldier asks the Smoker where Archibald is gone, and is shocked to hear of his death. The Smoker then spins a web of devious lies, pinning both Archibald and Jeremy's murders on Fritz, and basically implying that he's responsible for everything that's happened to him and the Soldier throughout the film. Everything this man has told you is a lie. He also delivers one of the funniest lines in the entire movie. I am the only sane man here. In case it's not clear already, I'll spell it out that in getting baptized by fire and becoming the smoker, Jacques is transformed from an asshole sidekick to soldier into an outright maniacal villain. He immediately demands that his two prisoners play Russian roulette with him for seemingly no reason. And soldier goes first. Then the smoker. And then finally Fritz gives it a try. You're gonna make it, Fritz. I know. No! <sighs> Goodbye, Dr. Ludwig. Fritz dies from a gunshot wound for the second time in the movie, and the smoker then dismisses Soldier, stating, I'll see you at the funeral, before disappearing into thin air using his cloak. Now invisible, the smoker quickly runs over to the exit door and locks it behind him, which is unnerving in the moment, but also kind of hilarious if you stop and imagine what he would look like actually doing that. Busting through a window to escape, the soldier finds his rocket launcher next to Jules's corpse, sitting in the same electric chair we know he once used to execute people during his respawn machine trials. With nowhere else to go, Soldier makes his way toward the same shutter door we saw Jules stare in disbelief of earlier, and we finally get a glimpse of what he saw. An impossibly large hole filled with dead bodies. If our protagonists were just on the execution floor, then this must be the dumping ground for all the execution victims. Something starts trying to tear down a wall in the execution floor, so with nowhere else to go, the soldier plunges down into this place that looks a lot like hell. We can also assume that this is the site of those 800,000 bodies that Jules mentioned on the phone with Blutark earlier, and it seems like most of them are clones of the soldier, but why? Well, it could be because he's the most popular class in the game. Name, at least according to this study from another YouTuber named Toofty, or it could be referencing Meet the Medic, where a similar pile of blue soldier corpses covers the battlefield in its final shot. But me personally, I think it's because he'd probably be the most roundly useful mercenary to clone. He's not too frail and not too big. He's got boots on the ground military experience. And I mean, Lyndon B. Johnson had to be impressed with him for one reason or another. This whole theme of cloning and not knowing how many versions of you are out there being abused is actually something that a famous Half-Life 2 mod called Entropy 02 touches on, which is kind of funny since the two came out not long apart. Standing on a mound of bodies, Soldier spots a roaming dump truck and quickly hides. The back of the truck is full of his dead clones, and we see it stop to shovel in even more. As the truck turns around, Soldier quickly climbs on top of it and causes it to briefly stop. He jumps into the back and is once again reunited with his rocket launcher. More dead clones get dumped on top of him, and as the truck starts moving again, he seems to briefly fall unconscious. It's then that he sees a strange vision of his fallen friend Cyclops. A true enemy has yet to reveal himself. This line is a bit confusing for a couple of reasons. For one, pretty much every major character in the film has already appeared in one way or another by this point, and there doesn't seem to be any widely accepted answer as to who exactly the true enemy Cyclops refers to is. A few people even seem to think this line is a setup for something that won't be made clear until the next Fortress Films movie, which I guess is possible. But for two, this line seems to be referencing The Sopranos of all things. Our true enemy has yet to reveal himself. Who in turn were bastardizing a line from Godfather 3. Our true enemy has not yet shown his face. 
As far as I can tell though, the line that Mrs. Blue uses is specifically the Sopranos twist on the quote, which is really weird. Most of the film's references thus far have been to other horror films and games, so it's a bit jarring for there to also be a reference to a random joke from a mafia drama show, especially since it also happens to be one of the most confusing, vague, and unexplainable lines in the entire movie. Maybe there's just something I'm missing here, I don't know. Anyway, Soldier jolts back awake after the dump truck he was in crashes on its side, and he climbs out to head forward on foot, but he doesn't get far, as it turns out the truck crashed directly in front of a broken bridge. This whole area here is a near perfect recreation of the ending scene of The House That Jack Built, a movie from 2018 that draws heavy inspiration from Dante's Inferno. In that movie's final scene, its protagonist Jack has entered hell, and comes across this broken bridge that's stationed directly above a pit leading down to its lowest depths. He's told that he can either accept his fate and spend eternity here, or he can attempt to cheat God by climbing the rock wall to the other side and accessing the stairway to heaven. Despite being warned that no other man before him has ever succeeded in making it to the other side of the broken bridge, Jack takes the chance and, like a dumbass, plummets into the flaming abyss below. Emesis Blue's twist on this scene is a bit more puzzling. We don't really know if this place is also supposed to be a vision of hell, or if it's an actual literal location in the slaughterhouse. The scene also plays out a little bit differently to how it does in the original film, because unlike Jack, Soldier is equipped with the perfect tool to cross this gap, his trusty rocket launcher. However, looking up from the pit and toward the stairs, Soldier once more spots an apparition of an infantry I'm still not sure if this is meant to be a vision from Soldier's time in World War II or from the respawn trials we saw at the start, but either way it seems to strike some hesitation or survivor's guilt into Soldier, distracting him just long enough to screw up his rocket jump plan. As Stalingrad returns once more, accompanied by another dump truck, both of whom start pushing up from behind Soldier. Soldier winds up using Stalingrad as a launch pad to rocket jump from, and unlike Jack, he does actually manage to make his way across the broken bridge's gap. However, right after landing on the other side, Soldier looks back on the fiery remains of Stalingrad, and when he turns back toward the stairs, he suddenly comes face to face with a shadowy figure who shoots him in the chest with a revolver, blowing him back off the bridge and into the pit below. I thought it would be smart to look at the screenplay for clues as to who this shadowy figure is, but unfortunately it isn't much help. He stands to his feet and turns back to the stairs. Someone is standing there. Soldier recognizes him, but it doesn't make any sense. I originally figured that it was the Undertaker who shoots Soldier down, but I was surprised to learn that if you brighten the image, the shadow figure actually looks a lot more like Jules, with his little mustache and tie and everything. I guess that's why the screenplay says this scene doesn't make sense. Soldier just saw Jules dead in the electric chair a few seconds ago. So is this a respawn of Jules, a clone, or just a plain old ghost? I don't really know. If you want to look at this scene on an abstract level, it might be saying that Jules is the one damning Soldier's soul to hell. Or it could simply be representing Jules' grand betrayal of Soldier's trust by abusing him and his clones in the respawn conspiracy. Anywho, after tumbling off the bridge, Soldier falls all the way down to the deepest point we've yet seen of the slaughterhouse, but thankfully survives because he lands in a pool of water. Good old fashioned source engine rules. After climbing out of the water into safety, he feels his chest for the gunshot wound, but instead pulls out the flask we saw him let Cyclops drink out of earlier. As it turns out, this flask actually stopped Jules' bullet. It's almost like Cyclops' spirit has saved him one last time, which is really interesting since we know how much Cyclops hated Jules. Finding himself in a long, curved tunnel that kind of looks like the Tunnel of Love from Left 4 Dead 2, Soldier looks back at the pool in fear of... something. <laughs> The tunnel itself seems to scream in agony at him as he begins to run away, every light burning out behind him as the darkness tries to envelop him. The screenplay describes him being chased by some kind of unseen entity, but the final film is much more ambiguous as to what's really going on here. Finding a ladder at the end of the tunnel, he climbs up a suspiciously short distance before arriving back on the surface through a manhole. Once he makes his way up, he sees that it's raining outside, and as the soldier gazes to a downspout on the side of a building, he sees the water traveling back up it from the street. There's probably something to be said about Fritz and Soldier both seeing an with downspouts, but I can't really think of anything that would represent, so I'll leave that to the real film bros. Somehow, Fritz's ambulance drives by, with Jeremy sitting in the passenger seat. Then, Soldier looks across the street to see his past self sitting in Jacques' car. Apparently, he was the one who spooked himself during that scene at the start of the film, giving us yet another time loop. Though here, the sequence ends a little differently. Soldier is then knocked back to reality. He picks himself up and leaves the slaughterhouse through the same sewer tunnel he entered it from, then looks up to see the entire building burning and collapsing behind him. Limping away from the destruction, he stumbles and trips, then looks up to see that somehow, some way, the hulking monster Stalingrad has once again returned. Soldier gets punted across the ravine, but lucky for him, it puts him just out of range of a huge chunk of the slaughterhouse that immediately falls over and collapses on top of Stalingrad, killing him once and for all. Finally free, the soldier lets out a scream of relief, horror, rage, and anguish all in one. Ah! Or I guess taunts with his shovel. 
After a fade to black, we come back to Soldier some time after his escape from the slaughterhouse. He's in casual clothes, speaking to an agent of Builders League United named Stemmons, who gives him a Mike Ehrmantraud-esque rundown of what will happen going forward. My name is Agent Stemmons. You don't know me, but I know all about you. I'm here to debrief you on the situation. Conaghy Slaughterhouse is a dead zone. There's nothing left of it, and I think that's for the best. It was actually scheduled for demolition months ago, but Governor Archibald prevented that from happening. He had his secrets, Mr. Doe, but you discovered something that we find deeply disturbing. Something that threatens the foundation of this company. Whatever it was you saw inside Conacher's Lot House, you are not to speak of it with anyone. Not a soul. Do I make myself clear? Good. Is there anything else you want to tell me? He then tells Soldier that Jules Archibald's funeral will be held on Sunday, and that his old friend Jacques also survived the slaughterhouse, somehow. Soldier goes to visit his old friend in the hospital, but it's not a pretty sight. Jacques' flesh is completely burnt off, and he's propped up in a position referencing a famous gruesome shock photo. A lot of people say this photo shows radiation victim Hisashi Auchi, but there's a lot of inconsistencies between the image and the description of that case, so the photo probably just shows a very, very unfortunate burn victim. Don't go looking for it if you're squeamish, it's pretty unpleasant. The fact Jacques is still puffing a cigarette in his hospital bed is pretty Funny, though. I guess they don't call him the smoker for nothing. Anywho, as we officially leave the Conagher slaughterhouse for good, we finally made our way to the closing chapter of Emesis Blue. Chapter 7 opens at the aforementioned funeral of Jules Archibald. You know, since he was murdered in cold blood by the smoker back in the sewers of the slaughterhouse. Despite the condition we saw him in in the last scene, the smoker himself manages to come to the funeral, now wearing a white mask to hide his disfigured face and sporting some kind of vocoder on his voice. And even though just a second ago we saw that Soldier escaped the slaughterhouse relatively unscathed, he arrives at this funeral in a wheelchair with a cast on his leg. It turns out that the cast and wheelchair are props supplied by the smoker, who's also given Soldier a card with text to read out loud. He's expecting Soldier to aid him in covering up his murder of Jules. The card itself reiterates the same lies the smoker told Soldier back during the Russian roulette game. It blames everything from Jeremy's kidnapping to Archibald's death and the slaughterhouse's destruction on the now deceased Fritz, smearing him as a violent cult leader and painting his death at the hands of that Russian roulette game as an intentional crazed suicide, when in reality, Fritz was a victim of the smoker just as Jules was. The other side of the card advises him to follow the script, but Soldier has another idea, as we'll see in just a second. Blue Tark Man arrives at the funeral and seemingly implies that in this universe, Jules Archibald was the man behind John F. Kennedy's assassination. I met him in 1960, right after the election. He was going on and on. How do we get rid of this son of a bitch? Redmond then arrives at the funeral as well, and Blue Tark confronts him about his collusion with Jules. I've just come to offer my condolences, Blue Tark. Balderdash, what was my friend doing in your compound, Redmond? I don't know what you're talking about. He was like the brother I never had. You slaughtered him. Admit it. The smoker takes the stand, and we see the Respawn Corps briefcase he stole from Fritz sat next to the podium. He begins to give Jules his eulogy, and it's made clear that news of the Conagher Slaughterhouse's destruction has made it out to the public. The smoker describes Jules being kidnapped by cult members, and the rescue operation at the slaughterhouse going awry, then calls on Soldier to come up to the stand and attest to his lie that Fritz killed Jules. Instead, when Soldier wheels his way up to the stand and looks at the blood-soaked card again, he bursts out laughing for the entire funeral attendance to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Embarrassed, the smoker pushes him back and shocks the audience with images of Jeremy's beheaded mother, pinning that murder on Fritz as well. Right as the smoker begins announcing that he's taking over Jules's position in his wake, Soldier prepares to pull the pin on a grenade in a kamikaze attack. But all of a sudden, Despite all of our characters being miles away from the now destroyed paranormal slaughterhouse, something impossible happens. <laughs> Fritz pops out of the casket and shoots the smoker in the head. Twice, actually. It calls back to one of the early lines of dialogue Jeremy said to Fritz in the prologue. If they ever hit you with something, you hit back twice as hard, you hear me? 
Ignoring the fact that Fritz has just come back from the dead for the second time in the movie, and popped out of another man's casket, no less, his visual appearance in this scene is really weird. He's much more pale, skinny, and gaunt looking than normal, with massive sunken rings around his eyes. His outfit appears to be inspired by the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. The same movie we mentioned earlier is an inspiration for the scene where the strange faces applauded Fritz beheading the butcher. However, this time Fritz's audience doesn't respond with applause. They respond in shock and horror. The people in the church pew, including Redmond and Blutark, begin spilling out into the streets in a panic. Soldier, however, remains seated in his prop wheelchair, in awe of what he's just witnessed. A lone blue security guard pulls his pistol and tries to gun down Fritz, but fails miserably. As we see the crowd rushing out the front doors of the building, The Undertaker appears once more, and stares down Fritz in what reads to me as a silent satisfaction. Our two protagonist's eyes meet for a moment, and Fritz spares Soldier as he begins walking out after the crowd. As Fritz steps out onto the street, we see the Plague Doctor once more peeling off in his black hearse. Then three more armed men from Builder's League, portrayed using the mercenary model from Open Fortress, arrive at the scene, and crash their car before hopping out and opening fire at Fritz. Fritz gets pinned down, but out from the church comes Soldier's grenade from earlier, showing that the two have each other's backs. As the car full of goons blows up, Soldier tosses Fritz the Respawn Corps briefcase from the smoker's corpse. A few police officers arrive and open fire at Fritz as he flees the scene, and then we cut to Blutark and his driver booking it away from the funeral. Can't you go any faster? I'm flooring it, sir. The shooting at us! Run all the red lights! What are they good for anyway? Look out! As Blue Tark bleeds out in the back of his car, Soldier walks up to the open window. After taking in the sight, Soldier draws a pistol and shoots the man at the top of Builder's League four times, in his final act of revenge for the respawn conspiracy. With Archibald, Jacques, and now Blue Tark dead, we can assume the company has no future. Meanwhile, Fritz gets bumped over by a Blue Team branded ambulance, just like the one he used to drive. He holds the driver at gunpoint and smashes the window, pulling them out through the broken glass. Staring down the barrel of a gun, the doctor begins begging for his life. Fritz looks down at him, seemingly remembering the innocent healer he once was, and ultimately spares him. Fritz's touching moment is interrupted by a squad of officers who roll up and draw guns on him. It's actually the same squad and chief we saw earlier in the film investigating the scene of Jeremy's mother's beheading. Fritz blows two of them away with his gun and drives off in the stolen ambulance. After Soldier's revenge, we see Redman come up to Blue Tark's crashed car and look in at what remains of his brother. Good gravel! I won! I outlived you, brother! I am the last man standing! Fritz runs Redman over, wiping out the head of the Red Team and most likely ending the gravel war entirely. Inside Fritz's ambulance, the camera pans over to show Jeremy watching him in the passenger seat, a bit like Jane at the end of El Camino, but he isn't there when Fritz looks over. We can probably assume this shows that, even now, Fritz is still acting to try and avenge Jeremy's spirit. We see a newspaper from the Mortem Post confirming that nine people, including the Man Brothers, were killed in the attack. We also catch a quick glimpse of Agent Stemmons looking out the window, probably pretty pissed that Soldier didn't stick to him in the Smoker's script, and the fact that with Blue gone, he's about to be out of a job. Quick editor's note, what I said here and earlier in the video about Agent Stemmons being a representative of Blue Team is apparently completely wrong. I missed this while researching the video, but the writers have outright confirmed that Stemmons is actually a CIA agent. I don't think I was too silly for assuming he worked for Blue, though. This line on screen definitely made it seem like he did. The next scene shows Fritz still driving on the road in his stolen ambulance some time later. It's easy to assume that this scene takes place a few hours or maybe a day after the last one, but we see that Fritz is wearing different clothes now. And according to Anton, this weird glimmer in the background is actually SO9 from Spy's Disguise. Assuming that means the last part of Spy's Disguise with Fritz happens in between this scene and the last, that would mean that this is at least a few days later since SO9 spent so long in Fritz's care. I do think implying that goofy video happened in the midst of this nightmarish evil paranormal journey is a little strange, but what can you do? Eventually, Fritz grows tired, the road outside looking a little lost highway-y, so he pulls over and stops at a bar. Dell's bar, actually. The same Dell from Spy's Disguise and who we saw serve Cyclops earlier. Fritz waltzes in, clearly just as confused as us, and looks to the bartender. Dell then echoes Zed's line to Jeremy from earlier. You look lost, stranger. I am. Or you had I don't know. Nearest town's back the other way. That's not where I'm going. So where are you going? Do you have a phone? No. I think I'm going to be sick. Restroom's in the back. 
Fritz takes the key and goes to the bathroom, but not before looking over to see the deceased Maynard and Zed on the other side of the bar. Zed once again playing the piano. Very obviously, Fritz has entered the afterlife. He opens the men's room, another big M on the door, and heads through. Inside, Fritz locks the door and steps into the final Shining reference of the movie. As he stares into the sink, we see Dell lower his newspaper down to reveal the same eyeless face as Maynard had. Dell pulls up a phone from under the bar and calls someone who we don't get to hear. Fritz gazes deep into the mirror, and then someone starts banging on the locked bathroom door, just like we saw it happen to him at the scene of Jeremy's mother's beheading. He looks down at the bottle of Valium he's been taking since the start of the movie and says, Good help me. It's a phrase that we previously saw sprawled on the wall of the dungeon in the slaughterhouse. It means God help me in German. Fritz chugs the pills before spitting a tooth into the sink, again calling back to the dream Jeremy described at the start of the film. Pulling the label off the Valium bottle, he drops it into the basin, revealing that underneath is a second label for Emesis Diazepam. He looks up to see his reflection in the mirror is gone, and instead, the black-clad Fritz from the funeral stands behind him. Suddenly, a toilet flushes, and out walks Jules Archibald, whistling in the Hall of the Mountain King. He washes his hands and gives Fritz a little awkward giggle before leaving the room. We then hear Scout say, Hey, Doc, from off screen, and Fritz smiles. After that, we're abruptly brought back to the real world, where Fritz has crashed his stolen ambulance. We see his body in the driver's seat, with the same respawn core from earlier glowing red to his side. His buttony eyes and missing teeth look the same as they did when he seemingly caught himself mid-killing Scout's mom, but at least he's died with a smile. Now, Fritz's proximity to the respawn core is presumably what brought him back to life in the intel room, and maybe even in Archibald's casket earlier. So that means he'll be coming back again any second now, right? Right? The next scene shows the respawn machine gurgling Fritz out, and he respawns one last time, engulfed in the fiery ruins of Conagher Slaughterhouse. The movie finally comes to a close, and after the credits, we get an ominous shot of Jeremy and Fritz's old photo, slowly fading to just Fritz as it drains all color. So, I know that might have been a lot. The movie gets harder to follow as it goes on, and the last chapter especially pulls the viewer all over the place. But here is my take on the events of Emesis Blue, as coherent as I can possibly make them. Jules Archibald, in collaboration with Helix Technologies, sells Blue Tark Man use of his occult respawn machine technology to help him win his war against Red. With Emesis Pharmaceuticals prescribing diazepam pills to anyone who experiences medical problems from the respawn machine. Jules then, however, goes behind Blue Tark's back to sell use of his respawn machine technology to Redman Man as well. And under the new operating name Conagher Slaughterhouse, Jules establishes Two Ford as his covert operations base with the help of two maniacal engineer brothers, Zed and Maynard. Under Jules' new faction at the Slaughterhouse, his lackeys carry out an agenda of their own completely separate from Red and Blue, instead donning black. Unfortunately, the respawn machine Jules placed at the Slaughterhouse begins to distort in wicked ways. According to the film's writer-director Chad Payne, this is because the machine was being overworked and supplying soldiers to both teams. This overworking of the machine is presumably the root cause of most all the insane and surreal things our protagonists see throughout the film. That's what the movie's description means, by the way. A private detective and washed-up war veteran team up to find a blue team executive, yet the man they hunt is more dangerous than they can possibly imagine. Jacques and Soldier head out to save Archibald, with no clue of the paranormal horrors their boss has unleashed, nor how untrustworthy, dangerous, and evil he really is. Among the most puzzling characters we come across in the movie is The Undertaker. He's a shady figure who dons black, much like Jules' other lackeys, but is shown to be not only uniquely rebellious, but also paranormal in nature. He stalks both Fritz and Jeremy, and the games he plays with them seem to work in service of destroying the slaughterhouse. Fritz begins gaining supernatural powers of his own throughout the movie, as Soldier, with the help of Cyclops, uncovers Jules' conspiracy, the full truth of the respawn machine, and how much of an abused pawn he's been at the hands of Archibald and the Man Brothers' corporate greed. Jules' radish betrayal of his colleagues is paid back in kind by a betrayal from Jacques, who returns as the Smoker and kills him to steal his position in the company. After the Smoker and Soldier narrowly escape the slaughterhouse's destruction, the Smoker frames Fritz for everything to cover up Jules' conspiracy, so he can keep lining his own pockets going forward. He doesn't make it far, though, as Fritz somehow cheats death and pops out of Archibald's casket to put a bullet in his head. Though Jules was never really forced to answer for his crimes, his funeral is destroyed in a bloody shootout at the hands of Soldier and Fritz, and in his wake, his empire he spent years building seemingly crumbles, leaving his legacy permanently stained. The Man Brothers' petty squabble that led to the deaths of untold men ends in a fittingly pathetic and violent way. And once Fritz's final job of killing Redman is finished, he stops resisting and finally embraces 
Fritz's death once and for all. On the way to the afterlife, Fritz sees Jules whistling in the Hall of the Mountain King. This is the same tune the murderer from the 1931 M film from earlier whistles during his abductions. As if to signify to both Fritz and the audience that Jules was the real murderer, the real villain of the story the entire time. He also hears Jeremy welcome him, indicating that Jeremy's spirit has forgiven him and understands the hell he's gone through to avenge him after his murder and destroy Jules' wicked plot. As the movie ends, however, Fritz is pulled back into the depths of the respawn machine once more, denied his happy ending, with his soul seemingly doomed to the flames of the hellish respawn machine technology forever. Now, even with me trying to condense everything there into as neat of a box as I can, the story is still a bit confusing and there's a lot of scenes that still carry unanswered questions. One of the first things you're made to wonder about is who killed Jeremy's mother. At first, the movie seems to want you to think it's Fritz. Between the bloody bone saw Jacques finds at the crime scene, the nightmarish vision Fritz gets of himself standing over her body, and the eyewitness at the scene describing a violent assailant high on drugs fleeing in an ambulance, it's not hard to see how Jacques and Soldier initially concluded that Fritz was the culprit. We also later see Fritz do the same head dangling and whistling trick with the butcher's head. However, I don't think Fritz is guilty of the beheading itself, at least not consciously. I think he simply stumbled across the scene of the crime afterward, heard a cop knocking at the door and knew exactly what it was going to look like if they found him standing there, so he fought his way away from the scene in an unconscious panic, his manic blackouts leading even himself to not know whether he's guilty of the crime or not. Archibald's funeral scene pretty clearly shows us that Fritz serves as a scapegoat for many other horrific things in the movie he's not guilty of. And in their discord, the filmmakers even seem to hint that Jeremy is mistaken about who killed his mother during his encounter with Fritz in the basement. And for those reasons, it's my interpretation that either The Undertaker killed Jeremy's mother but is framing Fritz for it, or that very literally The Undertaker possessed Fritz's body to make him commit the crime, mirroring the plot of that Dr. Caligari film with the hypnotist using the sleepwalker. It makes more sense for The Undertaker to collaborate with the Butcher in this gruesome act of violence than it does for Fritz to, and I think The Undertaker has a clear motive in trying to trick Fritz into believing he's the one responsible as a means of using his guilt to control him, just as he also uses Jeremy's kidnapping to control him, if any of that makes any sense. The second thing, and I touched on it a little bit when I first mentioned the Respawn Corps, is Fritz's revivals. I think it makes a lot of sense that the Respawn Corps briefcase is what powers Fritz's resurrections. However, it is a little weird that he not only comes back, but comes back as a stronger version of himself, with superhuman strength and crazy good hand-to-hand -hand combat skills. I think I have a theory for why, though. As I mentioned a second ago, the film's writer-director says the reason Conagher Slaughterhouse's Respawn is malfunctioning is because of an overload caused by Jules pimping it out to both red and blue at the same time. So, if using too many people weakens the signal of the Respawn, machine and causes it to distort, would it not make sense that a respawn core being directed on a single person, in this case Fritz, would work extremely efficiently and maybe even go into overtime to totally rejuvenate them? The power of an entire respawn core being directed at him, I think, is what gives Fritz his undying quality and allows him to cheat death as he does in the movie. And when you think about it, that would explain why this suitcase was so uniquely sought after. Third, I want to talk one more time about the time loops that Fritz and the soldier experience. The most popular theory in the community seems to be that they're a hallucination caused by the Emesis diazepam pills. But with the mercenaries being shown literally attacking each other in these time loops, and Jeremy also being a witness to the loop in Fritz's office, I think my theory from earlier about them being space-time anomalies caused by the respawn machine holds up better. Additionally, Soldier experiences loops despite saying he never took any of the pills. Some rationalize this by saying his hallucinations come from his wartime PTSD instead, but I feel like that doesn't make much sense. I know people with PTSD in real life, and even they don't chuck crowbars at future versions of themselves. So yeah, I think the time loops are just fuck-ups caused by the occult respawn machine that plays with time being overloaded. On a more meta level though, I think they serve mainly as hints to the audience that the events of the film can and are actively being affected by future versions of characters. Which brings me to The Undertaker. The Undertaker is probably the most confusing character in the entire movie. As I mentioned a second ago, despite repping the slaughterhouse's signature black color on his clothes, the things he drives Fritz to do throughout the movie seem almost expressly intended to accelerate the slaughterhouse's destruction. And that's the other thing too, he's clearly somehow related to Fritz. The use of a doctor mask directly links him to Fritz's identity as a healer, the black hearse he drives and crashes directly parallels the ambulance that Fritz drives and crashes, and of course, Jacques and Soldier believe the two to be one and the same early on in the movie. A lot of people's first knee-jerk reaction is to interpret The Undertaker as an alter ego of Fritz, but even taking Fritz's clear hallucinations and psychosis into account, that doesn't make any sense. The photos The Undertaker slips Fritz in his office include Fritz within them. He can't be distantly stalking and photographing himself, and he can't be prank calling himself either. These photos aren't only seen by Fritz either. Remember, they're also discovered by Jacques and Soldier, so they're real. That means that though these two characters are clearly linked, they can't possibly be one and the same. So what gives? After thinking on it a good long while and reviewing all the scenes he appears in, I believe that The Undertaker is... 
Well, fuck, he's fucking complicated, okay? <laughs> My reading of The Undertaker is that in one way, he embodies all of the people who have been tortured by the respawn machine under Jules. He haunts Fritz with visions of the respawn machine's horrors and leads him there with the kidnapping of Jeremy in order to get the place destroyed. Similarly, he could also be interpreted as another jaunt or failed respawn of the medic from the slaughterhouse's fucked up respawn machine. And that's his motivation for specifically wanting the place destroyed. However, and I'm fully ready to get ripped apart in the comments for this one, my personal theory is a bit more kooky. Throughout the movie, there are two characters who we see bust and come back with ominous titles. I'm referring to this red sniper, who returns as the hunter after being blown up by soldier, and Jacques, who returns as the smoker after going up in flames because of his cigarette like a dumbass. There's also the butcher, who is a pyro, the class most closely associated with fire. It seems that once reincarnated, baptized by fire if you will, these characters all begin donning black just as Jules lackeys do. I eventually realized that The Undertaker sounds suspiciously similar to these other characters' titles. Now there's only one character that it would make sense for The Undertaker to be a reincarnation of, and it's Fritz. Because of this, I view The Undertaker as the future ghost of Fritz. Think about it. Fritz dies in a fiery crash, and we see him respawn once more in the fiery depths of the respawn machine. This is the moment he gets baptized by fire, just as the other characters were before they were reborn. This new respawn version of Fritz is sent back using the demonic contortions of time and space that the respawn machine creates, and commits heinous actions to lead Fritz along not only to help avenge Jeremy, but also to help avoid a paradox and ensure his own genesis. It probably sounds a bit out there, but pay attention to the fact that Fritz starts taking after The Undertaker more and more as the movie goes on. After reviving for the first time in the intel room, he gains quick hand-to-hand -hand combat skills just like those we see of The Undertaker. After reviving for the second time at Jules' funeral, he slims down to a more slender build and starts wearing black instead of blue, just like The Undertaker does. Even the gun Fritz shoots Jacques with in that funeral scene is the same one we see The Undertaker wielding in the first chapter. Though, to be fair, a soldier is shown to have one too. Note how ruthless Fritz becomes in the last chapter as well. He starts killing innocent cops, exactly like we heard The Undertaker do on Soldier's police radio at the start. And in the afterlife scene, the black turtleneck wearing apparition of himself appears behind Fritz in the mirror once his reflection disappears, which I think symbolizes Fritz losing his real identity as he prepares to don the Undertaker persona. Saying it's Fritz preventing a paradox might seem a little cheap at first, but if you look deep, I do think it genuinely offers a very interesting answer for the Undertaker's motivations. In the first chapter, we see him steal the respawn core from Jacques, and where does he seemingly leave it the next time we see it? Inside the Conagher Slaughterhouse Intel Room, just right next to where Fritz dies, so that he can respawn and then take it out of the slaughterhouse with him and basically help birth himself in a weird way. In Soldier's World War II vision, we see The Undertaker playing chess with Fritz. I interpret this as a visualization of The Undertaker trying to predict Fritz's moves to continue setting up the series of events that play out through the rest of the movie. In the final scene, after crashing his ambulance, Fritz dies smiling. The writers say this is because he saw something that made him happy. In my interpretation, what made him happy is both hearing the spirit of Jeremy forgive him, as well as the realization that his, Jeremy, and Jeremy's mom's deaths were not in vain, and that it all happened for a reason. To some, the two characters being one and the same through time travel might sound like a cheap answer. But just think about it. How much else of the movie revolves around characters interacting with their past selves? It's clearly a major theme of the film, and I don't think it's that much of a stretch. Oh, and one last thing. I said at the beginning I was going to try to figure out what the fuck an Emesis Blue is, and that wasn't entirely a joke. Here's my interpretation of the title's significance. Emesis means to regurgitate or vomit. I believe that in this context, it refers to the respawn machine regurgitating mercenaries by respawning them. Everyone's getting prescribed the Emesis pills because of all the problems their body is having when they pass backwards in time through the respawn machine. That's why the pills are called Emesis Diazepam. They're a special type of diazepam specifically intended to treat the mercenaries for what happens when they're regurgitated by the respawn machine. The packaging disguises the pills as regular Valium, so as to not arouse suspicion about the concerning things that happen to people who go through the respawn process. The movie is called Emesis Blue because it follows the Blue Team and the story of them taking down the respawn machine and putting an end to their quote-unquote regurgitation. At least, that's what makes most sense to me. Before I wrap this up, I do want to mention how interesting each character's arc is. Soldier is the closest thing to a hero in the story. Being led by Fritz and the Undertaker's clues, he finds his way to the slaughterhouse and uncovers the dark secrets of his corporate overlords. He escapes just in time to watch the whole Conagher slaughterhouse building collapse behind him, and plays a key role in putting an end to the facility's evils once and for all. Most of his arc revolves around his survivor's guilt, whether it's the Russian roulette or his military past, extending all the way to his near-active side at Jules' funeral. The last thing he does in the movie is personally kill Blutark, as an act of revenge. One of the most interesting things I noticed about Soldier is that in the scene where he's transported back to the trenches, he's shaken up by watching a young infantryman get shot in the head. But in the previous scene, he jokes with Jacques about how he didn't know the sniper in the tunnel wasn't going to shoot him in the head. 
It's almost as if he was inviting the death he saw his fallen squad mates face because he thinks he deserved it more. Fritz, meanwhile, is in a perpetual fight trying to save his soul. He seems to be tortured by his greater knowledge of the respawn machine, as well as the Emesis Diazepam pills, giving him psychosis and seemingly an unconscious alter ego that guides him to do awful things. His journey helps lead to the destruction of the Conagher Slaughterhouse, though the process turns him into a ruthless killer and seemingly dooms his soul forever. However, knowing that he's done as much as he could to make right what happened to Jeremy, and that his friend's spirit has forgiven him, Fritz dies happy in the end. I think it's really neat the contrast Fritz offers to Soldier. Fritz has things to live for, but is constantly being put down. Meanwhile, the Soldier has almost a fearless, cynical death wish, but keeps finding reasons to live. It helps speak to the way the Emesis Blue universe treats life and death as fluid concepts that weave in and out of each other. And finally, Jeremy, much like the little children in the M film, is an innocent victim of a predator he could never understand the true cruelty of. He's robbed of a normal life by Archibald and Blue, then tortured by his mother's murder that he initially believes to be at the hands of his once closest friend. He then dies a gruesome death at the hands of the Conagher brothers and is locked back in a coffin in the depths of a building that's later demolished. His body never found, according to this newspaper. However, we see that in the afterlife, he's forgiven Fritz. I assume for what he managed to do in helping bring down the hellish respawn machine that tore his life off track. He's basically the biggest victim of the story. Of course, this whole video has just been my own interpretation of the film, and we're talking about a story that has unreliable narrators with alter egos and amnesia, dream sequences, clones, hallucinations, zombies, outright paranormal occult activity, a non-linear timeline, and a bunch of references that leave you wondering what scenes are literal and important and which are just references or somewhere in between. So I think part of the fun here is hearing everyone's interpretations, and I look forward to seeing people's input in the comments below. Regardless, one thing is clear. Emesis Blue is really cool. I love how creatively it flips so many ideas from TF2 on their head. I love how many characters are shown in a completely new light, and I love the entire premise of the film. To make something actually unsettling out of a game that was first and foremost created with the intent of being comical and cartoony is no small feat. Fortress Films basically had to battle against the source material of TF2 to create Emesis Blue, and the fact that it actually turned out good is beyond impressive. There's moments where the humor of TF2 almost pokes back out, but gets suffocated in the dreary misery of the rest of the world. And the fact they teetered that line so well is why the movie is so immersive and captivating. It's also really cool that Emesis Blue serves as an in for TF2 fans to get into this kind of horror. Beforehand, you had to be a certain kind of nerd to go watch The Shining, or especially something like M. Now you can get hooked on this stuff with familiar TF2 characters, and the whole thing actually stands on its own as a pretty good watch. I think it's also important to note that because its creators are actual students of the art of filmmaking, Emesis Blue also has, at least in my opinion, much more value than other lazy horror flips of recognizable characters we see online. It has coherent themes and character arcs, which you can't say of something like Sonic Exe. However, it still has enough fun action scenes to be interesting and appealing to people who don't give a fuck about that sort of thing. Unfortunately, however, this movie does not pass the Bechdel test. As you can see, in her one short but underrated appearance, the sole female character does not get the chance to speak with another female character. Seriously though, I think Emesis Blue does a really good job of showing how much potential there still is for storytelling in the TF2 universe, and how much of a shame it is that Valve has left these characters to rot. It's also sad knowing that, with the Saxe Awards discontinued, Fortress Films will probably never get any official recognition from Valve for this thing. Also, it's a bit fitting that TF2's world is being kept alive by Australian guys, isn't it? I originally wanted to make a video on Emesis Blue back when it first came out, but I knew it was going to take too long for me to digest, and if I rushed one out, it would just wind up being a glorified plot summary and list of references. So hopefully letting it breathe for a year and coming back to it once it's dust and settled helped me better understand the story and make a more coherent interpretation of it. Since Emesis Blue's release, it's inspired a lot of awesome fan art and edits, and definitely become somewhat of a cult classic. It's helped establish Fortress Films as well. Most recently, they did some really cool animation work on Pyro Cynical's Entropy 2 video, and they've even announced another TF2 film in the same universe coming soon, Murder, Inc. From what little they've shown the public, it looks like it's going to star a scout and sniper named Jimmy and Chuck, and we'll apparently be learning more about Jules Archibald in it. The team also seems to be going even harder on the Pulp Fiction Mafia vibes this time, and I personally think it looks really promising. Maybe I'll wind up making a video on that when it comes out, who knows. But all in all, what is there to take from the story of Emesis Blue? Uh, something something, the M is blue, and engineer mains are fucking evil subhumans. On a more serious note though, I reached out to Emesis Blue's director Chad, and him and the team sent back a pretty exciting statement to put at the end of this video. So to close this out, here's a word from Fortress Films directly. Releasing Emesis Blue in February last year almost didn't feel real at all. For about four or five years, this entire project has been this elaborate fantasy world that we locked away in our own heads. The script was only 20 pages long, and it was originally about a simple game of 2 4 told from three different perspectives. But over time, the story became much darker. The more we explored it, in one way or another, it became an origin story for the respawn machine, clocking in an almost 
two hours when it was originally only meant to be 20 minutes. It might sound surprising that we never set out to make a feature film, but I think it's just as surprising to us that we managed to pull it off at all. It's a supernatural industrial thriller flick and I'm glad people actually like it. The reception's been incredible. It's really nice when someone says your movie is one of the best films I've ever seen and they can't stop thinking about it. That's really what we want to achieve going forward, especially since now we have the means to keep doing it. We've also received immense support on our Patreon, which has grown from around 25 people to over 400. I really appreciate that, but now we have to figure out how to fit 400 names on one screen. <laughs> I think Emma's Blue has changed the TF2 community more than it's changed us. There's so much great fan art and all this speculation going on about it even though it's a fan-made project. I know that the TF2 community has been kind of left behind without any new content for a long time, so it's nice to give something back that they can all rally around and really enjoy. There's still so much to explore with the TF2 setting and its characters even though it's 17 years old now, and I think that's a testament to how strong this game holds up even today. And the fans definitely keep the ball rolling. We're always trying to push the envelope with new ideas and captivating stories. We've been using Source Filmmaker since it came out in 2012 and making a feature length film is really no longer an obstacle for us. In fact, we want to keep doing that. Emesis Blue was a great project to work on. Not always a pleasant experience, but it was a learning experience nonetheless. And now we've streamlined the filmmaking process, so now it won't take another five years to do another movie. <laughs> God willing. In time, when the next project rolls around, it's going to be bigger and better than what we've ever done before. It's going to blow your mind. I think that's all I can say. We'll be back. Thanks again to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Make sure to check out War Thunder now for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox, and use my link in the pinned comment or video description to register. Those of you who are new or who haven't played in the last six months will also receive a massive bonus pack across all platforms, including multiple premium vehicles, in-game currency, and more.